This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.32 p.m. When I call your name, please um, state your uh, present. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. And McDonald present. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Chair Hall. All right, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order the meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 6.33 p.m. and start with roll call attendance. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Stancer. Ms. Stancer present. Ms. Barlow. Barlow present. Mr. Menino. Menino present. And Hall present. Okay. Thank you. And seeing a presence of a quorum of the Regional School Committee, I'm calling to order that meeting at 6.33 p.m. And we'll begin with a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And McDonald present. Thank you. Um, we'll now move into public comment. Um, and for folks watching at home, we have substantial volume of written public comment. Um, all of it has been posted already on the website. It's on the Regional School Committee agendas page. Um, if you scroll down to tonight's meeting, you'll see the link to the document for public comment. It is over 50 pages long, so I'm going to scroll very quickly when we get to that. But I'm gonna start first with the voice comments um, uh, before I start sharing my screen. Hi, this is Emily Howard. I have three daughters in the school system, two sixth graders, soon to be seventh graders next fall, and uh, uh, freshmen. And we are in favor of the later start for many reasons, and hopefully just wanted to submit a comment. <laughs> um, and more importantly, we're in favor of a mass vaccination campaign for teachers in March. Uh, please, 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 please. I hope the town will prioritize teachers next, in the next phase. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Hi, my name is Nicola Usher, and I live in Amherst. As we near a year of remote learning, I sincerely hope you will move forward quickly with getting as many students and teachers that want and need to be in school this school year. With 80% of districts in the Commonwealth providing some level of in-person learning, including in neighborhood towns, it is unclear why we remain an exception. All signs point to masking and distancing remaining our reality in the fall. Our kids need to get used to and comfortable operating this way in the classroom. Give them that experience now not in September after another unusual summer with limited interaction. I hope you will vote to get our kids back in school as soon as possible. However you vote, please vote decisively. There is not a lack of information or any conflicts of interest unique to this situation that warrant extension. We need decisive leadership. The discourse surrounding this issue has become increasingly hyperbolic and contentious. To be clear, no one is advocating for a forced return for all. We do not want everyone to have the same thing. We want everyone to get what they need. There seems to be a small number of families with students who are thriving with remote learning. That's awesome for them, and they should certainly have the opportunity to remain remote through the end of this academic year. Educators who are unable to safely return to school buildings should also have the opportunity to remain remote. However, families who are struggling, as many are and have been, for going on a year are desperate to get our kids back to school. Questioning union leadership is not anti-teacher or anti-union. I myself am a proud MTA member. It is critical thinking based on what is now months of public of data on public health outcomes around the world. The desire for in-person learning is not anti-teacher. There are teachers who want to be back in the classroom as the remote environment is less than ideal for them as well. The voluntary return, while well-intentioned, has just made an inequitable situation even more so. My daughter's teacher is amazing, truly amazing. 
the need for my daughter to get back in the classroom for the sake of both of our emotional well-being has nothing to do with her teacher. No matter how excellent a teacher is, most eight and nine-year-olds cannot get what they need academically, and more importantly, socially and emotionally, on a screen, and their parents cannot effectively work inside or outside of the home. I applaud that the district has provided free breakfast and lunch throughout the pandemic, but the numbers of meals being distributed that have been highlighted at your previous meetings do not take into account the increase in families that are newly facing food insecurity because parents or caregivers, disproportionately women, may be unable to work due to lack of childcare. On a personal note, I want to publicly acknowledge that the Wildwood Specials team is absolutely crushing it. The work they are doing is remarkable and they provide bright spots in otherwise increasingly miserable weeks of remote learning. Please get our kids back in school. Thank you. This is Alicia Reed. I'm an Amherst resident and parent of two elementary school students. My kindergartner is one of the lucky few who got to return to school yesterday. All of her classmates, all of them, who had been in person in October returned to in-person yesterday. If that pattern holds across the district, 60 to 70 percent of our district families still want the option of in-person and have yet to be given that opportunity this year. As we approach the one-year anniversary of school closures, our fourth grader has grown increasingly moody, angry, and is somewhat withdrawn. I reached out to the school counselor who indicated she's heard the same from other families. How many children in our district are suffering emotionally and academically while our schools remain closed? I trust Dr. Kate Atkinson when she says she sees the effects of remote learning and that her Beltrathon patients are doing much better than her Amherst patients. Someone told me in October that they asked one of the APA executive board members, what about the students who will suffer if we stay remote? The board member's response was that the APA represents the teachers and the school committee represents the students and parents. We are asking you to represent us and to put the students' needs at the front of your decision making now that you have the opportunity to do so. Per the Gazette's report today, the union is planning to engage in a more collaborative approach including forums for educators and families to discuss in-person plans. It is now March. The collaborative forums occurred last summer and the time for such slow moving processes has passed. We need the school committee to lead at this moment. Hadley, Northampton, Hampshire Regional, and most other surrounding districts have shown that in-person and hybrid models can be done safely for K-12. We have the opportunity now to scrap all of the bad decisions made in the past and to draw on the best of what others have done around us. I hope the school committee takes this opportunity and commits to returning all students to the building at the health director's discretion, of course, uh, but as quickly as possible. And I thank all of you for your work uh, and your time and the tireless efforts you put in throughout this school year. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ellen Boucher. I'm a resident of Amherst and the parent of two Wildwood students. Um, I'm calling because today the New York Times published an article titled, In Their Own Words, Why Experts Say Elementary Schools Should Open. It was based on a survey of 175 pediatric disease experts, and it asked whether schools needed to wait for low rates of community spread or vaccinations for teachers to reopen. 86% of these experts agreed that these conditions did not need to be met for schools to reopen, with masks social distancing and proper ventilation, schools can safely reopen now. When asked what their concerns were if schools remain closed, ex these experts stated things like child abuse, food insecurity, depression, anxiety, acad academic deficits, and social isolation. One comment that particularly resonated with me was from Greg Gonzalez, who is assistant professor of epidemiology at Yale. He said, we are going to have a lost generation, a set of children who fall behind educationally with deficits that could affect their entire life course. The school committee needs to act now to support our most vulnerable students and families and to assure equity within our community. I appreciate that the APEA has created a proactive planning committee to begin preparing for a return to school. I support the school committee collaborating with the APEA. But I urge all sides not to delay any longer. Clear, decisive leadership is needed now to safely get our children back into the classroom. Thank you. Hey, my name is Bennett Hazlip. Uh, I live in Amherst. 
as kids at Bedford River in middle school. Um, just want to say that, you know, we were all teachers, parents, kids, everybody, and be afraid of what we didn't know about this virus in August 2020 when the committee signed a well-meaning but fundamentally flawed agreement with the union. We've all gotten a lot smarter and more knowledgeable since then. And now I've run out of patience with those who say that even in response to a deafening chorus of scientists, doctors, and public health experts in encouraging us to reopen safely, that we should just blindly stick to the completely outdated August metrics and what? Conduct more family outreach? Work toward the mirage of community-wide consensus? Go begging to the union only to be told to talk to the hand? Wait for the union to organize another committee? There are obviously arguments that decide to run out the clock until there's really no choice left to be made this school year. Let's make the call now so that our kids can enjoy a warm, safe spring and summer together, reestablishing the human connections that are so important for their ability to learn and thrive at a safe distance. As a Fort River parent, it was painful to see a handful of kids happily returning to do just that at Wildwood and Crocker in the pages of the Gazette this week, knowing that there are currently no such plans for Fort River. When we reopen, if we find ourselves suddenly at risk of a new variant, we'll have to rely on the insights and guidance of public health directors and actual experts, not some immovable, outdated metric we decided on last August. I mean, just look around. We can do this. Thank you. Hi, this is Caroline Damon, and I live in Amherst. I'm the parent of four children here. My youngest is almost five and should be in preschool at Crocker Farm this year. Though the preschool opened this week, this will not affect my son. His preschool experience ended March 12th, 2020 due to the pandemic and has continued as the schools have not opened this year. So I understand the priority put on high fee students, and I'm glad they are receiving these services. I am sad and disappointed my son is not. As a peer, not receiving services, remote or in-person services were not offered to him this year through Crocker. So we are looking ahead to kindergarten in the fall. For the rest of my children, uh, one is in first grade, one is in third, and one is in fifth at Fort River, I implore you to open the schools, all schools, including Fort River, before the summer break. You've worked so hard and put so many protocols in place. Please figure this out before the school year ends. I can't tell you the sadness and even anger all of my household feels that schools and towns around us are open, and now even within our own community are opening, but not the one we attend. All risk cannot be eliminated, but it has been reduced significantly. Please open the school. Thank you. My name is Laura Muller, and I'm reading this public comment on behalf of myself and 17 co-signers from the Emmer School community. As the school com committee moves to a more intensive phase of planning for return to in-person teaching, we ask that you commit to a process that entails inclusive, thoughtful, and transparent collaboration with all members of the ARPS community. While there are reasons to move swiftly, as Dr. Morris stated in a recent Amherst School Committee meeting, quote, we are not interested in trying to rush things. When we rush things, we make mistakes, and this is not a time when we feel like we can make them, end quote. In that spirit, it is critical that the coming transition involve a mindful, deliberate, and inclusive process. We ask for three stated commitments from the Amherst and Amherst Regional School Committees. One, families who wish to rem remain remote for the remainder of the academic year are able to do so with minimal disruption. Equitable education must be available to all community members. We ask that the school committee balance the needs of families who want to return to in-person learning with those who need continuity and a robust rem remote education. The remote option must continue to provide the high quality education we have seen so far this year in order to ensure that medically vulnerable students and families do not find themselves in punitive circumstances, such as outsourced virtual academies or largely asynchronous work. CDC guidance released February 26 states that families who are at increased risk of severe illness should be given the option of virtual instruction. Likewise, we hope that the school district will honor commitments made to teachers who, for personal reasons, need to remain remote at least through the end of this school year. Two, before families are asked about returning to in-person or remaining remote this spring, there is a great, real need for greater transparency in what the implementation of in-person and remote education will look like. Without such information, families lack full knowledge of the conditions that they and their children will face and cannot make informed decisions about school this spring. 
Similarly, without empirical evidence of family preferences, schools cannot accurately design their plans. Three, the school committee should postpone any votes on a return to in-person education beyond the current voluntary plan, particularly any compulsory return, until they resume robust, respectful, and transparent collaboration with the APEA. Throughout the forthcoming planning, decision-making, and implementation, educators, including teachers, school staff, and administrators, need to be at the table. With so much complex work ahead, listening to the wisdom of, the respect for the experience of, and commitment to transparent collaboration with those people who work with our children every day is paramount. While the union's deliberative decision-making process may be at times slower than desired, it is intentionally inclusive of all voices and will ultimately contribute to producing a well-thought-out, implementable, and safe plan. In addition, collaboration with educators is critical to creating a foundation for future cooperation and healing of the pandemic. Hello everyone, my name is Suzanne Warren and I'm an Amherst resident who is the parent of a senior at Amherst High School. I would very much like to see a return to in-person instruction. I'm also a speech pathologist currently working in two different area vocational high schools. Both of these schools have successfully implemented hybrid learning models since the very beginning of this school year. On any given day, only about half of the students are in the school so there are plenty of opportunities for social distancing. The students and staff were given clear instructions regarding the use of PPE at the start of the year and strict cleaning protocols were also initiated. The students and staff have demonstrated excellent compliance with these new rules. And while COVID has periodically impacted the school community, there have been no reports of in-school transmission of the virus. I would like to see the same model implemented in the Amherst Public Schools. Remote learning allows for many more distractions, such as phone use or video games, especially if those students have parents working outside the home or the student has not yet developed the executive function skills to manage their work successfully. Many of these students are failing their classes as a result. I'm lucky. My own son has managed his classwork well, but I know he would love to be able to see friends in person and participate in some of the activities best enjoyed in the school environment. While sports have continued, the students like my son who are more musically inclined have not been able to participate in person in the many excellent groups at Amherst High. Even if the musicians can play or sing outside, it would be a vast improvement over what's happening now with individual parts being recorded in the home. I hope you will agree that we must get these students back into the school building in some capacity before the end of the year. Thank you. And as a reminder, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Um, this document is available on the um, ARPS.org website on the Regional School Committee agendas page. As mentioned, we have a high, high volume of comments, so I'm going to scroll relatively quickly. Some of the comments in this document also were um, recorded as, as voicemails. Um, so uh, those are sort of double, double duty. Can everybody see the document? Thank you.
Um, as I mentioned, um, all of that, uh, that entire public comment document is available on arps.org on the Regional School Committee Agendas page. Um, uh, down at, if you scroll down to the date for tonight's meeting, you'll see it next to the agenda packet. Um, I also will note that because we have another meeting tomorrow evening, any comments that were received after our 3 p.m. deadline will automatically be included in tomorrow evening's, um, tomorrow evening's public comment. I don't believe that we have any minutes to approve, so we will skip our next agenda item and move right into the superintendent's update. Dr. Morris? Sure. Got uh, seven items. I'll try to keep it brief. I um, want to thank uh, Applewood, which is uh, a community in South Amherst. They invited me to come and, and meet with residents virtually on Saturday and talk about update of the schools. And just, uh, you know, everyone works really hard. Saturday events aren't loved by everyone, perhaps, but it's just really enjoyable to interact with that population. Uh, they were deeply, it's a re kind of retirement community. Uh, deeply in, invested in uh, learning what was happening in the schools, deeply concerned about uh, making sure our students get a good education, not just COVID education, but in general, and fa fabulous, fantastic questions and dialogue Saturday morning. So I want to thank folks for inviting me to Applewood and just really enjoyed that. I hadn't been there in four or five years uh, for a session and uh, just a different community that I usually get to interact with talking about schools and, and really enjoyed it. A second one, uh, uh, let's see, it's Monday. So that was yesterday. Um, the Student Advisory Council at the high school uh, invited me to um, meet with high school students to talk about the budget situation. Again, just I got questions about E&D. I got super technical questions, as did Principal Sadiq, Assistant Principal Gramacki, who were there, uh, as well as kind of broader questions about uh, how we are where we are with our budget situation at the regional level. Um, just very impressed. And um, Ella Stocker, who's a librarian at the high school, uh, it's the kind of the faculty rep, I'm probably not having that right word, that uh, phrasing right, but uh, to that group, but just really it was about 15 students who joined 15, 20 students, I think, and uh, really helpful dialogue um, to talk uh, about budget, but then of course we went into other matters as well, but um, always anytime I can work with students, that's a good day. So on that topic, uh, I was at Crocker Farm yesterday for the first day of the voluntary reopening, so kudos to the staff who did a fabulous job, Principal Shea, others who worked on Planning, you know, Jerry Champagne from IS drove over to for some last minute fixes. Facilities department came over for a motor that uh, or fuse that went kaput. Uh, that's my technical term. Uh, so Ben can laugh at me later. Um, and, uh, you know, just really, really uh, the staff in particular, teachers, paraeducators, uh, bus drivers, uh, friendly faces for students went, it went really well. I got to walk a kindergarten in, which is going to be the highlight of my week, um, back to class for the first time since October. Uh, and just, you know, again, really uh, my gratitude to all the educators who made that possible, as well as many other people in our organization. Um, just an update on the voluntary return. I know we have other things on the agenda where, you know, we'll talk about return perhaps, but um, at Wildwood, we have grades K, 3, 5, and 6, and beginner ELL students slated for March 25th. Middle school, we're working on the SSP program, uh, certain students for mid-March, uh, and high school ELL students also looking to mid-March for those. So I'll give updates uh, next week uh, on where those are, but uh, really, really just wonderful day and just uh, exciting to see. Go on to uh, an update um, that's sort of related to one of our topics tonight, but I think it's better situated here, which is late start uh, or changing start times. Uh, we are working with the town to assess how to increase the uh, lighted lighting for fields at the high school. So right now we don't have the, the wattage to light both fields simultaneously, so there's a switch. Uh, and we're working on multiple options of how to increase our capacity so that uh, if students are getting out a little bit later, in terms of athletics that our home, you know, we have more capacity on our home fields uh, to operate, especially later in the fall and early in the spring. Pretty, pretty much late in the fall is the, the big time it gets tough where uh, the sun goes down quite a bit earlier, but also early in the spring to give us a little more capacity for that. So thanks for the town and our facilities department for working on that. We have a kindergarten registration uh, getting kicked off in two weeks. Uh, we'll have an event on March 15th in the evening. Uh, that's for elementary, you know, uh, folks in Amherst and Pelham. And we'll have an event, um, a virtual event for families who are interested in learning more about our kindergarten program. 
thanks to Marta Guevara, Mildred Martinez, and the Family Center, who really spearhead a lot of these efforts uh, around enrollment and registration at the elementary level. And we're excited to greet some kindergartners. We've reached out to the local preschools. Um, we're going to get the banner up in downtown so that people do hear about the kindergarten registration event. So my second to last one, I uh, want to give another shout out to Brittany Upchurch, who's a physical education teacher at the high school. She has a particular interest in specialty. Uh, she works in many ways. She was a graduation speaker for those of you who went to graduation a couple years ago. Uh, but um, adaptive physical education is a passion of hers. She's providing training for all the physical education teachers in the district. And she is spearheading an effort um, for our schools to apply to be Special Olympics Unified Champion Schools. And that's a program for schools pre-K through university that intentionally promote meaningful social interaction, social inclusion by bringing together students with and without intellectual disabilities to create accepting school environments, utilizing three components, which is uh, the Special Olympics youth leadership, uh, unified sports, inclusive youth leadership, and whole school engagement. Uh, when we were in person last year, um, she was one of the people who uh, organized um, an adaptive PE class that for the first time uh, at the high school level, um, that I'm aware of anyway, included um, neurotypical students working with students with intellectual disabilities. Um, and she came to our leadership team meeting last week and kind of got our principals, system principals and directors riled up in, in a good way, uh, who reached out to their physical education teachers. So we expect uh, our application to go out this week and hopefully we're accepted into the program. Provides a small amount of funding, you know, for some equipment, but more than that, it, it, it ensures a commitment to be part of a larger organization that can offer technical support to our physical education program. So, you know, we're very fortunate to have Ms. Upchurch on our faculty and our other talented PE teachers who are very invested in uh, the inclusion of all students in movement because we know how important that is. And my last thing, uh, as of a couple hours ago, I was notified that um, the president today uh, announced a hope that all educators and school-based personnel would receive their first shot in the month of March. Um, apparently through the, potentially through the federal uh, vaccine program through pharmacies as opposed to the state systems that uh, we have hearing so much about. Uh, I've never received no official, uh, you know, word on this. This is just, you know, reported in the news that people texted me about. As I get more information, I'll certainly pass it along. It's something that I feel really passionately. I know the committees also feel passionately about, you know, um, emphasizing the importance of vaccination for educators. Um, so uh, last I heard, there was no comment from the Baker administration, but it's a little unclear to me right now with all the information I have. Um, how involved states are versus the kind of the federal program with the the pharmacies. So I imagine more information will be coming in the next couple of days. Um, did see like, yeah, you could start signing up next week. Not everyone can get in, but uh, so uh, that's a, a big change from the advocacy I was planning to talk about tonight, which was also on the topic of vaccines and some work that folks had done uh, around the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and, and a bill that a bunch of legislators had signed and sent to the governor. So more soon on that, I only know what you know, you can read on news media. Uh, I've received no official communication on it, but just wanted to share uh, that potential good news. Um, and so that is my update for the evening. Are there um, questions from the, anybody in the committees um, for Dr. Morris? Mr. Dudling. Yeah, so just a quick comment. That's a really great effort uh, with the adaptive PE teacher. Um, I heard a lot of great stories about that program, uh, how it was really meaningful. Any these efforts that we can do to, to bring neurotypical kids uh, connecting with students with significant disabilities, really, really powerful, um, really powerful experiences. And it, it's possibly maybe the best buddies club at the high school could get involved in that because they do a lot of that similar type of work. Um, the question I want to ask you about was the senior class and graduation. Um, this has been on my mind a little bit, and I know that you're probably going to get really busy. <laughs> you're already really busy. We might make you even more extremely busy. We'll see. Um, but um, and so this is one thing I don't want to get lost, uh, which is, you know, this class has had nothing in terms of the joy, the celebration that the those special events that should be marking a senior year. And I know last year's senior class also took it on the chin, but at least they had kind of a normal year up until March. And this year's senior class, I, I just am really concerned about what we're able to do. And so graduation is obviously a big, is one piece of that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged by, by what the state is doing, that 
that this may lead us to be able to do um, an outdoor something kind of close to a, an in-person graduation. Um, but there's other things too. And, and I, I know it's not like, you know, these sort of celebration things aren't like top of the urgency priority list. Um, but I just feel like if, if we don't make a public commitment and by we, I mean the district, the superintendent, the school, school committee, that like, we're going to just, we're going to do what, what we can, right. To, to, to honor and, and, and encourage that, that the, these kids will go through a year and, and have that all be gone. So I just wanted to get your general thoughts and take on that. I know it's all about the details and implementation is really hard sometimes, but just wanted to get your take on it. I can be really brief on this one too. I'm trying to do better with that on a superintendent update. So uh, this came up in the conference call. We have, you know, depends how often, but weekly or every other week conference calls with the department. Uh, came up on those superintendents last conference call last week and uh, superintendents asked the commissioner to work with the Department of Public Health to give us guidance on what's permissible and what's not. Um, what we heard back is one of the hard things is we don't exactly know the track of the virus and what congregate, you know, how many people can congregate at once, even if outside. So uh, really, we're going to have to, you know, I know the high school uh, worked with some students, some seniors um, on gathering ideas, but until we receive public health guidance and what's possible, we're sort of still in idea mode. I think it's highly unlikely we'll be at UMass. I think that would be, uh, you know, that'd be a wonderful problem if all of a sudden we were able to be there. I don't anticipate that wonderful problem uh, happening. Um, but right now we're waiting on guidance from the state and public health authorities on what's possible. And I think we share the concern you have about the experience that uh, current 12th grade students have had over the last year and a half and want to make sure that we're celebrating them in, in the most meaningful way that public health guidance will allow us to. I do. I want to add to uh, Mr. Denling's um, positive uh, reinforcement on these um, Special Olympics and adaptive PE. I, my family and I have a long, 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 long history with Special Olympics, and it's um, a fabulous, phenomenal organization for what it does for its athletes as well as the families of the athletes. And um, I have less experience with the unified sports um, there, but I do know that it's um, also extremely impactful. So I'm thrilled to hear about this um, initiative. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none. Okay. Um, I will, um, I have a brief update. Um, next week, um, the regional school committee will have its second budget hearing for the regional um, uh, fiscal 22 uh, budget. The um, budget presentation will um, be posted and available probably later this week. Um, and for that um, for that budget hearing, it will be the same procedures for public comment. And we'll just ask that you note that it's for specifically for the budget hearing if your comments are for that hearing. So more to come on that, but knowing that a lot of people are probably watching right now, wanted to um, put that plug in for our hearing next week. Um, I am now going to look to our school committee. Um, are there any announcements from any um, committee members? Mr. Denley. Uh, CPAC, Special Ed Parent Advisory Council meets uh, this Thursday, 6.30 to 8. If you are a parent or caregiver of a student with special needs, you don't have to go it alone. It's an extremely supportive group, uh, very informative, um, thoughtful, lovely people. Um, so, uh, or if you just want to support students, uh, SEPAC at arps.org for the meeting link, uh, 6.30 to 8 on Thursday. Thanks. PM, correct? Uh, any other announcements? Seeing none. Great. Um, and I uh, neglected to note that this uh, meeting is being uh, recorded and live streamed um, on Amherst Media in Amherst on Channel 15 um, and online on the Amherst Media website. And thank you, as always, to Amherst Media for your ongoing support. Dr. Morris? I want to give them an extra special plug because they had like multiple meetings tomorrow night and they had to kind of... Uh, retrofit or do something to be able to show multiple meetings that are going on in the town. We're not the only only show in town tomorrow night uh, in particular. And just want to thank Amherst Media for being as flexible as they are uh, to make sure that these meetings, which I know are high interest to the community, are accessible. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, thank you, Amherst Media. I know, you know, through a curveball with a Wednesday meeting, which is not a typical night for a school committee meeting, it happened to be on the night of multiple other meetings in the town. Um, so just want to do an extra special plug tonight because we really appreciate their their commitment to accessibility of all this content, uh, which we know is, is high importance. So that was it. Thank you. Um, and also, uh, no, uh, we have, um, I think, two uh, additional uh, regional school committee members and Amherst member that have um, joined us. So um, welcome, Ms. Spitzer and um, Mr. Sullivan. Um, so now we'll move on to our new and continuing business. And our first item is the return to in-person spring 2021 discussion. Um, and just to tee this up, we, um, we have a proposed motion regarding a return to in-person learning um, that Ms. Lord and myself partnered on and circulated with the committee. We'll be looking at that and considering that for a vote for tomorrow evening. But just for uh, folks at home, I'll read that. The school committee will direct the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning for all students who want it beginning in April 2021. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions indirect consultation with local public health officials. So tonight we're discussing, um, and we don't have plans to vote this evening, um, that, mo that motion will be considered and voted on tomorrow evening. Um, and I want to also start our discussion with a little bit of context, um, and then I'll also turn it over to Dr. Morris to add some of his perspective before then we'll open up for um, full discussion. Um, we recently voted to commit to full-time in-person learning for all students for next fall, for the next, for the full next school year. And we noted during that discussion that a recent decision from the Department of Labor Relations in a case in Melrose suggested that remote versus hybrid versus in-learning, in-person learning models are core education decision and as such are not subject to bargaining and negotiation. And as we saw in the volume of public comment, a lot of our community members have also noted that same decision and read about it. Today, we received um, a written legal advice from our attorney specifically related to our MOA. Um, and I shared that with, with the school committee members um, this afternoon. Um, one most important part of that I will read um, that is based on the D Department of Labor Relations decision, those portions of the Amherst Regional Public School MOA that purport to establish metrics and phases related to the district's educational model are unenforceable restrictions on the district's ability to determine its educational model. It is important to note, however, that other aspects of the ARCS MOA that do not directly relate to the district's ability to determine its educational model, for example, those providing for certain PPE, establishing six foot boundaries, and creating access to technology would still be enforceable. And there's um, more things, but those are the pertinent items, I think, for our discussion um, tonight and tomorrow. Um, so just, I do think, I'll just restate that it's important to note that all those other parts of our MOA continue to be enforceable. Um, and just to call out that those agreements are the result of extended discussion and negotiations with the APEA. And so those will still hold in any potential return to in-person learning. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Morris to share with us some more implications of this proposed um, motion. And then after that, we'll um, take a similar approach that we did when we were discussing the budget, at least at the region, and go around the, the virtual room and enable everybody an opportunity to speak before we have some sort of follow-up and continued comment. And um, so um, that, is, that is your fair warning to be prepared when I call on you um, to speak. So Dr. Morris. Sure, I'd like to start with um, some just opening general remarks, and then I, I want to talk about elementary and then separate that from secondary. And I wonder, with the, both chairs' permission, if maybe we could pause after the elementary part to see if there's questions and then go to secondary, because it, it's a lot, right? This, this is heavy stuff. Yes. Um, so um, I want to start by just uh, doing something that, you know, I can't do enough, which is praising our educators, right? We've been at this close to a year. Right, it started on a Friday afternoon or Friday morning with uh, me recording a video and Dr. Guevara doing a translated video so that we would make sure that our uh, faculty weren't in the place of having to describe something that was happening to them and they weren't necessarily um, directly a part of the decision making. Uh, at that point, I think we said two weeks. I watched the video the other day. It's, it, it's, 
it's a little back to the future. -y. Um, it's very, very odd to watch that video now. And so um, to see where we are from where we've been, I just I want to compliment our educators for the incredible work they've done, how much how improved they are. I've got educators now saying, well, I've got three screens going. I, I got two, like I think I told you all a month ago and uh, two months ago, and I'm still getting used to two. And uh, folks who uh, weren't necessarily so keen on technology are, have now figured out ways to connect. I think our outreach from where we're at the end of the year with attendance uh, for students, uh, particularly for some of our uh, least or most underserved students, uh, we've gotten so much better at. So, you know, I want to frame this um, appropriately. And I think our educators, our facilities department, our food service department, all of the, the folks in the district have really risen to challenges as best as they could, given the context. Uh, when it comes to our students and families, um, I think one of the things that's true in the pandemic more generally, it has exacerbated uh, the different experiences that all of us have, you know, in Amherst, in Pelham, in Leverett, Shootsbury, and beyond. We have students who are doing quite well with distance learning and hoping it never ends. Uh, for some students, the anxiety of coming to school has been eliminated and they're able to focus much more on their academics. We have students who have struggled from the get-go and they've struggled the entire time, the entire year. And lately I've been hearing a lot about students who were doing really well and hit the December break or the February break uh, and really were hitting a wall. And we're hearing that from counselors, we're hearing that from families, we're hearing that from teachers. Uh, I want to frame this again, none of that's the fault of any of our educators, any of our staff. Everyone is really risen to the challenge and doing amazing work in the most challenging context uh, that we could ever imagine. I then want to talk a little bit about my frame of, frame of context. I was reading a book, not an education book, the other day, and, and it was kind of stated something that, that's staying with me uh, tonight, and I was thinking about it a lot as preparing for the meeting. So an author says that uh, often when we think or talk, we, make, we take on one of three roles, uh, a preacher, a prosecutor, or a politician, right? So the role of the preacher uh, is talking about sacred beliefs, and if sacred beliefs are in jeopardy, they work to promote our ideals. Prosecutors recognize and highlight flaws in others' thinking to try to win a case. And politicians, no disrespect to the elected officials here, try to win an audience and often lobby for approval. Um, and so I wanna share my perspective tonight as a pragmatist. Right. I know that we have families that want to stay remote for the rest of the year. And it's really important to me that families who want to stay remote have the same high quality experience that they've been having. Um, we heard that a little bit in public comments. I hear it uh, perhaps in different contexts than, than public comments. Uh, but we have families who have children um, where autoimmune wise, there's no way they can come back this spring. We have families who, you know, for, for a whole host of reasons would not choose for that. And then we have families, as I mentioned earlier, of kids who are having a better experience this year than they've had in school because their remote environment has worked really well for them and their, their teachers are doing an outstanding job. We also have students and families who really need to be in person. Um, the pragmatist side of me looks at surrounding districts, including charter schools, as well as traditional public schools, and sees that we're significantly lagging in terms of in-person days that we've been able to have for our students this year. Uh, I'm also conscious and hear the stories, not just in public comment, but actually more you know, directly from families about how hard this is for families, families who work in the evening and um, you know are getting very little sleep as they try to help their elementary child uh, do school and the people are, are stretched. We have families who are talking about real social emotional challenges that they're facing with their children at home. Um, the other thing I want to share about the pragmatist side is that there's a DESI mandate that's highly likely coming down for elementary schools very, very soon. Uh, whether we like that, whether we don't like that, and I'm sure there's a lots of differences of opinion of, about that. Um, I, I think, you know, if you read the tea leaves, it, it certainly seems like there's going to be a mandate uh, for elementary students coming back in person five days a week next month. Um, and so I think it is worth mentioning, you know, I don't know how much it goes on, you know, for committee members or community members, uh, but all the briefings I've had, um, you know, I, I believe there's going to be a state board meeting on Friday. Uh, we'll find out more then, but the stakes seem pretty high that are being set uh, for this approach. And pragmatically, that matters too. Um, you know, kids always come first, but there is some reality. Uh, that a board with supervision and oversight of local districts in Massachusetts may make a decision that gets forced on us. So I think it's incumbent on me, being the pragmatist, to try to make sure we're transitioning well for all staff, for all students, uh, whether staying remote, 
are moving to in-person, and this is uh, going to be a challenge over the next month. And you know, I want to talk a little bit about where we are with the planning and what I would propose as a path forward. So one thing that I do routinely, including today, um, is talk to the Amherst Health Director quite frequently. Uh, her general opinion is she's very comfortable with elementary schools returning with the safeguards we have in place. I'll describe those a little bit later, five days a week. Uh, frankly, this is consistent with a plan we developed in the summer and bargained about in the summer and early fall. Um, so, you know, in some ways, there's not a whole lot new uh, at the elementary level because this was the plan we were we were working to implement and started implementing in October. Uh, I think it's really important to note because there's a lot of three six six foot three feet six feet like desk difference discussions. And I think one of the reasons that I know for Emma and for me that we feel comfortable moving forward is assuming a typical yield of students who would choose to be in person versus remote. And we're seeing that yield in our conversations with the, the voluntary return when we call families. Um, we believe we will be able to maintain, and we feel confident we'll be able to maintain six foot distancing and have students all be in their elementary schools uh, without needing to go to hybrid. So many districts have gone to hybrid models because they can't maintain six foot distancing and have all their elementary stu students in. The reality is we've had declining enrollment for about 10 years and our buildings haven't, you know, since Mark Meadow went offline, we haven't shuttered any buildings. And so we have space and looking at other lo local districts and the yield they get for in-person versus remote when they've opened, we feel confident that we'll be able to maintain that six foot distance and we commit to maintaining a six foot distance uh, with students coming in. So I think that's really important because I know a number of districts, they're being really taxed right now to think about how can I get all elementary school students in I can't do it because our population won't allow for it in our, in our buildings, and that's not our situation. Um, I think an important caveat, and I'll, I'll say this and I'll go to elementary, that, that our health department has indicated though, as students get older, there are more concerns about an in-person return. Uh, this is no surprise in some ways because the president has talked about K-8 to uh, return. Our state right now is talking about elementary schools. And so we get to the secondary level, um, you're gonna see, a, pretty different discussion. And that's really based on the, gui the guidance and advice of our local public health official. Um, and I think that's consistent with everything that I've heard from the committee is you, you're looking for me to get public health advice from public health officials, and that's what I'm gonna continue to do. And it may be um, unsatisfying to people. Um, I know it will be probably for some people. Uh, I know it's also unsatisfying that we've not been able to resume um, in-home supports for students with special needs for the same exact reason is that uh, I'm making these decisions with the public health department guidance that I receive. And that's gonna be the guiding principle that you're gonna hear from me, you have heard from me, you're gonna hear from me moving forward. All right, so enough of that, uh, we'll go on to elementary. So uh, again, really we're looking to implement uh, in April, the same plan that you heard over the summer and was part of the bargaining process in the summer and fall. Uh, what is incumbent to do quickly is to gather feedback directly on which families plan to send their students back. Because without that information, we can't do the next steps on planning. So uh, if you do vote on tomorrow night um, to bring elementary students back, um, we would have a survey going out Thursday morning uh, with the language that you all have. We've already drafted kind of a model that needs to be filled in with what the committee needs to do with an FAQ document we have, we, would plan, uh, we have planned two forums for Monday, one in the morning, one in the evening, so that families can gather feedback and ask questions before they have to make a decision on in-person return. I think it's really important to stress, uh, we are not in the business in the schools of convincing families that they should send their students back to the, their children back to the schools. What we're interested in is giving neutral, objective information and letting families make the best decision that they believe is right for their children. Um, there is no hard sell, there's no sell at all. It's here's the program, here's our protocols, and if families feel comfortable, great. If families don't feel comfortable, great. And we have a remote learning model that we feel like has been successful for many of our students as much as possible. Uh, we would really look to get that feedback um, back pretty quickly. Uh, and again, no pressure, but you know what we would be doing is creating new bus routes, which is usually a two month process. And we'd be expediting that to a couple weeks uh, as you might expect, we'd have assigned seating on every single bus, so that's an additional step that's required of our transportation facilities department. We would use, we would be completely uh, redoing the class placement because we know we have certain educators who uh, 
have medical exemptions and would be staying in a remote model. We have other educators who'd be coming into the buildings and those are not equally matched to the students that would be doing that. And so that's a process that usually takes four to six weeks. Again, we'd be doing that in about two weeks. So all of this is, is going as fast as uh, we feel like we can do a good job and get things done to support students. Placement is also more complex than, than perhaps uh, I realized before I got involved in, in being a school leader and district leader, because there's ELL services that have to be delivered. There's special ed services that have to be delivered, Title I services that have to be delivered. And all of those have to be scheduled during the school day. And oftentimes those, in those to receive those services, students are seen in groups. Um, all of that has to be uploaded into our SIS uh, system, which is PowerSchool. That's usually a month long process with IS. Uh, again, we're trying to expedite all these processes as much as we can. We also have a system for all of our students uh, that's a daily COVID check, a text and an email that has to be uploaded uh, through PowerSchool as well. From a staffing perspective, we'll likely have to hire new people. It is less efficient to run parallel systems of virtual and in-person. Uh, so we know that we'll have to do that. The emergency licensure in Massachusetts um, gives us some flexibility. There are some outstanding paraeducators without the technical license um, who would be able to do that as long as they have a college degree of work with students. So we see this as an opportunity um, and particularly an opportunity to diversify some of our teaching force, uh, but it still takes time to hire people. Um, and so that is a reality that we will have to do some hiring, especially at the upper elementary levels, it's likely we'll have to do some hiring. You know, the lower levels, we sort of had experience, we got them in, we had that, uh, just the efficiency doesn't work as well in grades three to six. Um, some of our medical leaves have been resolved. So one thing we would plan to do is reach out to everyone who was granted a medical leave and make sure that's true. We've had uh, some of our volunteer people had medical leaves and um, as a result of their condition or whatever it was, things resolved. And um, you know, some of them are either back in the building or planning to be back in in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we wanna check in with those folks because that'll influence our staffing as well uh, on both the virtual side as well as the in-person. Uh, as you probably know, on December 27th, uh, the federal government passed um, ESSER II, so uh, stimulus funds, and we're allowed to apply for, use some of those funds for additional staffing needs in these situations. That grant is due at the end of this month, so we do need to organize uh, that grant because we don't have, at the elementary level in Amherst and Pelham, we don't have the funds to just be hiring people for the end of the school year. Uh, Technology-wise, we do have uh, enough Chromebooks and devices, one-to-one -one for students, but we also need to sort who's coming in, who's not coming in, and what devices they need, uh, as they would need devices one way or the other. So some of our students at home never got a Chromebook because they were using their home device, so there's a lot for the IS department to sort out as that happens as well. We would be planning a virtual training for families and students and staff on our protocols uh, before students came in. Uh, and this is a big one and it sounds simple, but it's not. I mean, I was there at Crocker Farm with very few students relative to the school. Uh, the drop-off and pick-off routines are exceedingly complex because we anticipate that many, many students will be driven by their families to school. Um, and even when we were in in October where we had um, K-1, you know, and then some special programs and Miss Lord is nodding her head because she thinks she was there. I think I saw her at one of the schools one day. Uh, it, it's a tremendous amount of organization and, and it's, you know, the, the biggest safety situation we always have is, is around transportation, whether it's buses, cars, but it's a lot of cars coming to the school at once to work out the logistics, especially as we go three to six. Um, I do want to go over um, some of our safety protocols. I know you've all heard them before, but what I find is I can't say these enough and we'll do this, you know, when we do those meetings for families who are on the fence uh, next week if we move forward. So just PPE, I know I get a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna write, I'm gonna read a summary of what we have for PPE. Um, so we've bought 253,518 masks. Uh, out of those, 16,000 are, are pediatric surgical masks, 120,000 are KN95 masks for staff. Um, if they should choose to wear, we have about 2,500 smile masks. Those are the masks that have the clear plastic around the mouth for speech pathologists, other people, ELL teachers other folks who that's really uh, critical for, 100,000 adult fabric masks, um, and, and I won't read literally the whole list. We have 58,000 face shields um, for staff who would like to wear them, um, gloves, um, we have 9,600 level one isolation gowns, 20,000 disposable isolation gowns, uh, over, uh, over 1,000 
scrub shirts, over a thousand scrub pants, and and about 600 scrub jackets for students working uh, with more intensive need students. Uh, more hand sanitizer than you know you'd believe. Um, and um, in terms of hardware, we have plexiglass trifolds in the office. We're still going to maintain not having visitors in the building. Uh, Electrostatic sprayers, we're up to 25 of those, which help for daily cleaning and spraying. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth repeating because I think it's been a while since we talked about it, that at Wilden and Fort River, we had major construction projects in the summer that closed down quads uh, and greatly increased the ventilation in buildings, which brings me to the second piece uh, that I wanted to speak about, uh, about on this particular topic, which is uh, we've now completed testing in all the classroom spaces uh, the ventilation is above four air changes per hour in all of them. And um, we have HEPA UV purifiers in them, even the ones that were tested over four that didn't quote unquote need a purifier. We have purifiers for all of those spaces as well. Uh, all of our nurses have been trained in contact tracing and we have, as we did before, uh, isolation rooms identified and CNA is certified nurse assistants there. So, uh, I, you know, I do feel very confident in our capacity uh, to implement safety protocols that are at or above um, our neighboring districts. Um, many of our neighboring districts don't have a commitment to four air changes an hour in, in every major classroom or have high quality purifiers in every major classroom. And that's really a testament to the facilities work and the facilities team for how much they were thinking ahead on this. The state just did their purifier purchase in like January for districts and we had them in place in September. And that just shows that people were really thinking ahead on our group. The last thing I wanna say is um, the timing. Um, so our initial draft of timing, which is obviously open up for your feedback and, and potentially Desi's feedback, because I'm not sure quite what they're gonna say, is that we would look to have our K-2 students, our primary grade students in uh, Monday, April 6th, I wanna say, if it's the 6th, no, April 5th, excuse me, Monday, April 5th, and then our three to six students in right after the April break on the 26th, and the reason we'd have a two-week gap, one of those weeks is in there is April break. But the reason we'd have a two-week gap is that um, we have a lot more staffing challenges to sort out at the upper grades. And then it also gives our principals and staff a phased entry. Um, so in terms of number of students in a building at once and all the transportation logistics and cars, it lets us phase a bit. Um, you know, I don't know if that's going to be consistent with what DESE requires of us to be candid. Um, I don't know that yet. I haven't seen officially what they're going to come out with. But that's when our team, our leadership team got together. We felt like this is a timeline we could do very well. We know our plan. We know our systems. We can always get more feedback. And there's a lot of interest in being outside more. And I think there's a lot of ways that we could collaborate uh, over the next couple of weeks. But we do need to get the logistics down. Uh, and that's why we need to really get very quick on a survey, get that feedback back. Uh, and then, you know, transportation placement and staffing the three major obstacles that we have. And if we are able to phase it, it allows us to phase sorting those in ways that our leadership team feels like we can do well and do right by the kids who are gonna be in the building, uh, as well as the remote students. Um, one of the questions that is, uh, you know, it's not rhetorical, but it is something that I'd like feedback on eventually is, it's entirely possible we may have schools that are ready a little bit earlier, especially on that back end, right? The, the upper grade levels. Pelham really comes to mind to be very honest about it, right? It may have less logistics than some of the other schools. Placement is not a concern at Pelham Elementary School in the same way it is at larger elementary schools. Um, so something to consider um, is whether we wanna have the same timeline for all four of our elementary schools across the two districts, um, or you know, giving progress updates you know, uh, around where we are. I can't guarantee that we'll be ready at any of our schools before those dates. Um, but I don't know how important it is. I know we've gotten a lot of feedback about the volunteer return and some perceptions that there were inequalities uh, based on who came in and who's starting when. Uh, so I'm a little concerned uh, about how to be perceived if we have a different timeline um, at different schools. But that was a whole lot to, to chew on and think about. And so I'm going to pause there because um, that's the end of what I wanted to share, at least in the front end of around elementary thinking. I will um, uh, take questions for Dr. Morris specific to elementary. And um, my first question on, is on the PPE list that you that you um, listed or spoke to. Is is that 
um, the same list that's published on our on our fall quote unquote fall return website. Um, so folks at home can go and look at that that list or. Yeah, so we're gonna so Debbie Osmond did a wonderful job of reorganizing it in a more user friendly, less facilities oriented uh, and business office facilitated uh, oriented format. So that's gonna if if we do go forward, that'll be in the survey link so that all families and staff have access to that. Uh, it's just a lot. It's a lot easier to look at, um, and I can maybe just share the screen just to give you. I mean, it's a public document. It's not like anything private, but um, just so it give you a taste because I think it really does um, to the lay audience uh, show a lot more than the other one, which got really into the weeds of um, this. So I don't, is that visible? Yes. Yeah, so you can kind of see it's organized by type, um, cases of gloves, you know, sanitizer, you can see how many pumps and refills and um, all those kind of things. So it's a little bit shorter and it's just a little easier to manage. But yeah, we would plan to include that in the FAQ part of what would go out Thursday morning, depending on your all decision. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mini. Uh, the Pelham School has seven classrooms and seven teachers. I believe you said the teacher will not be expected to teach simultaneously in person and distance learning. Is that correct? So that's actually, and it's a really interesting question for Pelham. So one of the things that we're exploring if teachers are interested is uh, the technology of sort of live streaming classes um, is not just like putting people in a Google Meet and just like, you know, they're pass they're passively sort of being ignored. The Some of our districts and neighboring districts are using a live streaming option. You know, it's nothing that we would require of any teachers, but we have had teachers who have expressed an interest in exploring what this is like, uh, particularly, um, and Pelham's an interesting model because there's not another class for them to the, for remote students to go to. Um, so it's maybe something we explore. It certainly wouldn't be up and running for all classrooms by April, uh, but it's going to be our test case where you are going to try to see what it's like, not to force it on any teacher in Pelham or Amherst or the region, uh, but it might be our test case um, if we have a volunteer who's interested uh, in trying that out, because I think what's a little different in Pelham is the classroom community, you know, that grade level is the teacher, right? And so um, if there was a place that we might want to explore that, Pelham seems like it might be, if teachers are interested, an interesting model to explore there. Um, Ms. Dancer? Oh, and then Ms. Hall. Um, Dr. Morris, can you speak at all to testing? Um, you know, that came up in some of the public comments that we received. Yeah. So uh, we have and have for a while now had Binex, which is uh, symptomatic testing. So if a student or staff member uh, is experiencing symptoms of COVID, they have an immediate test um, on site. We are part of the pool testing program. There's gonna be a, and it was on the agenda for tonight. We pushed it to next week because we figured we might have lots to talk about here. And also because we're getting more experience with it. And I'll be blunt to say that lots of districts either didn't participate in it or are having second thoughts uh, for two reasons. One is that if you don't get a high enough quantity of people to volunteer for the pool testing, it, it loses its value. Um, and lots of districts are having very relatively low percentage of folks participate. And the pool part doesn't really work if there's not enough people in the pool. You know, um, So that's one challenge we're facing. The other thing that is unique to our district is that uh, we do have free asymptomatic testing a couple miles away at UMass. Um, and uh, that's high quality testing. It does involve a second test in the same way pool testing does. Um, so you'll hear more about it next week, but we definitely have symptomatic testing on site. The pool testing, you know, I would say right now we're, we're thinking about it, we're exploring it, we, we're part of the program, we're getting stuff sent to us and getting trained in it. But um, Lots of districts, especially in Western Mass, are having really mixed feelings about how it's going, especially districts that started right away because they had kids in person. Uh, and I think we're understanding why they may feel that way. Um, and so if you hold next week, we'll, we'll go much more in depth with people who are more knowledgeable than me and Faye Brady and Robin Supernot, who's our nurse leader and student service director, not respectively, the opposite of respectively, um, with some thoughts on that. You know, the other thing to note is on this schedule, uh, the elementary, as a reminder, we're talking about a, a school day that starts later than typical elementary school days. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there's testing and, and our staff, if they chose, uh, and they choose right now, could choose, to, even if they reject pool testing, don't wanna be part of it, 
they could go to UMass on the clock and, and you know, if they can schedule their appointments and get tested and the hours are pretty good on that. So, you know, you'll hear a lot more about that next week, about the good and the bad and uh, what some, some benefits and some challenges are. Um, but the, asy the symptomatic testing is in place, you know, and, and that's something that's in place for students and staff. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hall. Um, can you, so the hiring of more staff, so the, these would, I guess, presumably be temporary staff people just to fill in gaps when there's remote and in-person options. That's exactly right. There's really a lot of inefficiency that comes from running two parallel systems and um, we would need to cover for that. Um, you know, and we can't really know who that is until we get the parent feedback, you know, family feedback, excuse me, the caregiver feedback, um, mm -hmm. know what our needs are. Okay. And is that, I mean, in terms of hiring educators temporarily, does that happen a lot in schools? I mean, is there is there a good sized pool that that seems realistic to expect we can do that? Yeah. I mean, so this year, sure. Um, you know, I think that that's happening a lot. And as I, I, I tried to mention before, we may have staff that we need to hire into different roles more than necessarily only hire more staff. So we may have like high quality paraeducators and actually they would make fabulous teachers. Licensure has been a challenge uh, and we may not need this paraeducator for this role, but we do need a teacher in a different role. So as much as possible, we try to rely on our own staff because they know our district, they know our kids. Mm -hmm. um, we can guarantee that that would happen for all roles. But, um, you know, for me, I'm, you know me, I'm, I tend to be a silver linings kind of person. And, and I think a silver lining might be that we might get to advance people to try out teaching career who, who in a different context might not have that capacity to, you know, just because of the licensure requirements and everything. So uh, not because of their capacity to work with kids. So uh, we, we may need to, and that's really some of the ESSER two funds are dedicated. You know, if you look at what you can use them for, it's for hiring additional staff for multiple models. And, um, you know, in all three districts, we have funds available explicitly, you know, for that. And, um, you know, I think it goes back to the beginning. Uh, and I'm not saying you weren't saying this, Sarah, I just want to uh, say that, you know, for us, it's how do we make sure that kids on, on both sides, the in-person, the virtual, um, how do we make sure they both have maintained that high quality experience we want for them and uh, and also make sure our staff are well supported to be able to be successful in their work. Um, so that's, you know, I think the reality is we probably will need more staff or staff in, in different roles and, and potentially um, moving some folks uh, to teacher roles when they haven't been in the past. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, I see two more hands. I see Ms. Stancer and then Ms. Seeger. Um, Dr. Morris, so thinking about uh, uh, Ms. Hall's question prompted this thought in my mind, what kind of space requirements would be necessary if you're going to have a remote instruction and an in-person instruction happening? You mean like with the, the pilot of if like, someone... Where's the remote person going to be if the teacher's in the classroom? Right. So the way the districts have done it is they set up, you know, uh, a camera so the class essentially gets live streamed so that the students are, who are in person are in person. The students who are accessing it from home get a high quality feed, not like, you know, frankly, what we're seeing here, um, but a high quality feed of the classroom. Um, and again, I'm not committing to that. I'm committing to exploring it. Um, but that's sort of the model that everyone maintains as part of the classroom community. I think particularly in Pelham, um, I know there's concerns about how that plays out. Um, and there was even in phase one. Um, so it's a possible solution. And, and, you know, right this year, if nothing else, we're exploring every avenue to possible solutions. And this is one we're going to take a look at. I think Jerry Champagne and Lee has been great as well about just thinking about this with Jerry. Um, so we'll see. You know, I think the big challenge is pedagogically, we don't want our teachers in person standing in front of a room and just talking to students. Uh, what I've heard from, you know, like in a sage on a stage mentality, what I've heard from some other superintendents is, is some of the cameras do have ways to be a little more flexible uh, that allow for students to feel more included in the school than perhaps the technology that I had seen prior. I think Miss C, she, she said Miss Seager, I think she's muted. <laughs> I just wanted to offer up a data point from Union 28 where we have four schools kind of doing different things. Um, Swift River, which is the New Salem Wendell School, is doing a um, thing where they're keeping their cohorts together. So they are going to be streaming the classroom. 
um, and having all the students still be part of the same group, whether or not they're in the classroom. So you do have a school that maybe you could share ideas with, um, just hey. to uh, that data point. We do have concerns about Pelham's Wi-Fi. That's another variable. That's why we're, we're field testing it um, because the Wi-Fi in Pelham is not quite as durable as it is in some of our other schools. Um, Mr. Demling and then Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, um, so uh, briefly, if you could touch on um, how cracked and opened windows fits into our layered mitigation strategies for airflow. That's You mentioned the HEPA. And, um and other things um but that's that's a big part that i know that um that we designed in so if, if you could touch on that um you know my, my other comment though is is on your question of if there are classes and grades at some built some of our elementary buildings the, the three elementary and amherst and the one in pelham that are ready to go but not all are should they go and i mean i'll just give you my perspective which is if if classes are staffed and safe and ready to go for in-person learning, then then they should begin, and and it's it's really two reasons. One is, um, I know it's it's not equitable across the grades in terms of what we're able to deliver at that time, um, but every model that we are dealing with is inequitable and has significant in inequities. Our remote model has major inequities in terms of its strain on economically disadvantaged families and on some of our students who have very little benefit or no benefit at all from remote learning that we can't fix because of their special needs and disability, which is tragic, but true. And yet we don't cancel all remote learning because, because of that inequity. It's the same issue we ran into with the, with the volunteer return. Um, and it's gonna be the same issue with, with this model across the grades, right? If you're a ninth grader versus an eighth grader versus a fourth grader, you may have a, a very different experience. So, um, you know, this this isn't whiteboarding uh, an ideal world in my mind this is you know i go back to your pragmatism theme you know and that that's where i'm at um is you know if it's safe and staffed we should do it you know the other thing too is there's really the the clock the clock is ticking really loudly in my ears right now with with, with everything that we do for the rest of the year and i look at april 5th that means that there's 12 weeks if you start on april 5th um left in the school year if you if you delay that three three more weeks you you're then losing a quarter of of your remaining time right so we can say oh it's only a week or two and april 26th is three weeks after april 5th but that's a lot of time at that point um and we're gonna you know students and teachers are gonna have a lot of work to do to um to reacclimate to this so that's just my my two cents on that so I'm just going to interrupt and just remind folks that we're asking questions right now. So um, uh, right. <laughs> after we've gone through um, the, the full presentation, then we'll go um, to uh, comments and perspectives. But. Sure. So uh, there was a question I want to respond to, which is uh, something I neglected to say. So thank you for mentioning is that windows are intended to be opened, you know, um, except for extreme weather circumstances. And hopefully as we get to April, uh, we have even next week, looks like we got some better weather uh, en route so that, you know, that is part of our mitigation strategy. I should have mentioned that, so thank you. But I think, you know, uh, Peter didn't ask a question, but I will take it as one because it's something that I wish I'd mentioned, which is uh, what's really important here isn't just the academic, it's really about the acclimation, which is going to take a while for students and staff to, to come in. You know, one of the things we notice is, is just about everybody who was in uh, this week at Crocker Farm had been in in October, and even though it was only seven days, it was seven more days than lots of other people have had in the building. Um, and I think, you know, it just, for me, it harkens back to like April where people went to the grocery store and you were in a different world and right, everyone watched that emergency room doctor with the ponytail from Michigan talking about washing your groceries and, and everything felt uh, really new. And I wanna just really respect uh, and, and, and talk about how important it is that our staff members feel like they have training and we have two dates, you know, where there's an early release day and a teacher work day and some hours dedicated because we want to make sure our teachers feel as safe and secure and our staff members coming back in the building. Um, you know, and I think there's a tension in how quickly we can do that. But I think it's really important in addition to logistics uh, because what we know is our students will feel safe and secure if our adults feel safe and secure and doing high quality training, making sure there's time with nursing staff, uh, all those pieces is going to be really critical. Um, as staff and, and students potentially return to the buildings. Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, so I, I think these are two questions. So first one is, 
we've talked a lot about you know how we'll be maintaining a virtual option well also, or remote option learning option and an in-person learning option i'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what planning if any has gone into in the event that we have students or groups of students who need to quarantine not because they necessarily have covid but because they've come into contact with somebody with covid and i think right now i i could be wrong about this. I think it's somewhere between seven and 10 days, depending on if you get a test or don't get a test. But even if you don't have COVID, you're gonna need to stay home. And I'm just thinking about the students who might lose out on learning if they've gone for the in-person option, the remote option, will that be something they can access? Or is it gonna be more like maybe in the old days of you know worksheets at home and maybe emailing between the teacher if you thought about that. And then my other question kind of goes, I guess it was two things actually. So the transportation issue, I know we've said we're really agnostic about whether or not we wanna, we're not gonna try to push anybody into choosing a in-person or choosing um, remote learning, but are, are we gonna take the same approach with transportation? Are we gonna be looking to have more parents drive their kids to school if they're able, or are we gonna kind of just see, do, do we have the capacity if, um, in the same way that our classrooms do to accommodate if, if everybody opted for the the buses. And then finally, I just wanted to point out um, with the pooled testing, um, you know, UMass is great. I've gone, I've taken advantage of it myself. Um, it doesn't allow you to bring kids under 10. Right. So it's a real limitation as I've seen with my kids who have been in younger, you know, they're younger, they're not in public schools, they're in preschool. But like if one of them develops a runny nose or has a symptom that might be COVID, I've got to get them tested, I've got to do it as quickly as possible so that I don't lose work days because they're home with, you know, a symptom that could potentially be COVID, but it's not. So I, it seems like the, maybe just to, to flag that we actually don't have testing for young children down the street. And it might be nice to consider that when we're, uh, making decisions about testing. So thank you. Those are my three common questions. So in terms of the busing, uh, our experience to date has been that there's a lot of families who want to drive their kids at the elementary level. Um, and so I think we have the ability to be agnostic. I mean, most districts, just to be transparent about it, we don't know what we'll find here. Most districts are finding roughly two thirds of elementary kids uh, in Western Mass, I can't, you know, this is an informal uh, conversational polling of neighboring districts. They're finding about two thirds of kids wanting to return. Um, our experience so far in the voluntary return as we've asked families, you know, kindergarten, first grade is a little bit of exception because they were already sorted by that. But in the upper grades, we're finding about that number. You know, like if you look at sixth grade at Wildwood, which is, you know, a, a good case study, uh, we're finding about two thirds. Uh, we are finding, you know, roughly half of those students so far wanting to take the bus and the rest wanting to drive their their family. So, you know, really, if you, you think about it, if two thirds kids come back and half the kids, half of those take the bus, you're talking about a third of the kids in the bus, that works fine for transportation. That's our case study. And that's what we've heard from other neighboring districts. We'll have to see how that, you know, what that looks like in reality once we get real numbers. But at this point, we'd want to guarantee busing for all students. And on the second one, you know, I think, you know, the Binex testing is for all age groups, um, you know, that we have in the school. So that's, you know, it's not an antigen test, right? So it's not as strong, but we have testing uh, on site for all students. Um, and that's individually administered for the runny nose. Let's make sure that kind of thing. So there's no, and again, we'll talk pool testing next week, but there's no uh, mixed feelings about that. It's really about, you um, is, is this pool test, what does it offer us for the, the you know, for what it costs? And are there other ways to achieve the same ends that um, may be more effective? But Robin and Faye will be able to talk in, in much greater detail than me. Thank you. Um, Ms. Barlow. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the virtual education for families who choose to stay virtual. So in the fall, my understanding was if a family uh, chose to stay virtual while their teacher went in person, they were transferred to an alternate um, teacher um, that was virtual only. Is that not on the table or I'd love to hear a little bit more about that? Sure. So yeah, I can be more explicit about that with the staffing. I mean, the reality is that students at all grade levels are, it's entirely possible and it's going to happen that students are going to have a change in educator or educators based on their choice. Now it's not 
it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's, you have an equal, roughly equal chance of having a change of your educator if you go in person or remote, right? It's not like, oh, if you're remote, then your teacher will change. If you, uh, you know, if you go in person, it won't. That's not the case. It's going to depend on the individual educator, individual student, and what class they're in. Um, Pelham's a little bit of a different thing, and, and I imagine you're asking from a Pelham uh, point of view, and, and probably, you know, we have a Pelham meeting a week from Thursday, and we may want to get in the weeds a little bit as to how it relates in Pelham, because it is a little bit unique there. Um, and so that's, again, one of the reasons we're trying to explore this other model for Pelham. Uh, if teachers, you know, no one's going to be forced to do it, but if teachers want to do it, um, because, you know, it, the forced choices look a little different when you're in a one classroom per school, um, one classroom per grade level school. Um, so, you know, if it's okay with, with you and with the chair, you know, that maybe is something we could talk about next Thursday um, in Pelham, because I think it is, a, is it, a, it is a unique challenge for Pelham. Is that okay, Brenda? Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks. But I think I'm glad you raised the point because the larger point, no matter what your district is, is that your student, a child's teacher may change regardless of what choice they make. It, it depends on a set of variables that won't be known at the point at which they're making the choice. I had um, just one more question, and you may have answered it already, so I apologize. But um, you, when you talked about um, the potential need for hiring in the elementary schools, and it may not be sort of evenly distributed across, um, I'll wear my Amherst hat across the Amherst schools. Um, is that going to, is that need only going to be identified once we know the student return um, plan, or do we know that already? Um, both, right? So we know where there are schools where there, and, and I'm being intentionally, um, and I know I've gotten criticized before, but I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm being intentionally vague because I, I don't want it to be identifiable um, as to which school or which individuals can't come in because I think that's really private information about people. And I know you're not asking it, but I'm just going to be transparent here as to why I'm being a little vague. It's not because I don't want to answer your question or actually don't have information, just it's not information I think that's fit for a public audience. So we do know that, you know, exactly. Once we know how many students would plan to come back in person, then we have to match that with the staff. But we know that there are schools that have more teachers who have medical exemptions for in-person at this point, and we know there are schools that have less. Um, and so we are conscious of that, and we do have uh, internal documents for, for with principals and myself and HR where we're aware of that, but until we get the yield, it's impossible to know where, you know, it could work out perfectly where a grade level where there are, you know, multiple teachers in a school that have a remote assignment, actually that grade level has a lot of students who have want a remote assignment and then it works out. So we don't know until we get the yield in, um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we have uh, documents and, and holes in our, you know, staffing roster where we anticipate there being uh, a need to hire. Okay. Thank you. Any l last questions on um, elementary before we move on to secondary? And Dr. Morris isn't going anywhere, so we can always come back with more questions later. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer, did you have your hand up? I just don't think I got a response. It's fine if you don't have one yet about the question um, regarding if a student has to quarantine for 10, 7 to oh, 10. Oh, I forgot that. I apologize. No, that you're 100% you're right. So Thank what would happen in a likely instance, I guess there's a couple things. One, the hope is that, you know, with students being six feet away, that we're limiting the number of close contacts and need to quarantine if we do have positive tests. Um, but kind of there's two scenarios. One is the class needs to quarantine for whatever reason, you know, and that one is actually sort of an easier solution. I think where we have one or two students quarantined, we would have to transfer them into another remote class for that time period um, just so they can continue with their curriculum. Um, so we have those two scenarios, kind of a, the fork in the road is how many students in a class are, need to quarantine before we say that the class is quarantining versus one individual or two individuals. Um, but I'm sorry, I wrote it down and then of course didn't get back to it. I thought of your other two questions, my apologies. Okay, so why don't we move on to secondary? Um, Okay. So second days, as I said, is uh, a little more complicated perhaps than the elementary. Um, being my pragm pragmatic viewpoint, there is not yet a state mandate around secondary schools the way that I anticipate there will be around elementary schools. 
That being said, um, you know, when talking it through with the health department at the middle school, um, you know, I've talked to Principal Sharon, and you know, what we'd like to see there is a is a hybrid model similar to what was in the MOA, but really skipping the the part that has one day a week, just given that there's so few weeks left in the school year that originally we were going to say one day a week for a quarter and then moving to two days a week. And we imagine that we'd want to have two days a week hybrid model at the middle school level. Um, we just don't have time for that phasing to work uh, for one day a week moving to two days a week. Now, this is a pretty typical model we've seen in Western Massachusetts and secondary schools. It's not anything particularly novel and it's consistent with what's in the MOA is like what we were going to build to. Uh, so again, we're trying to not reinvent wheels. Uh, that being said, uh, Principal Sharon uh, asked, and I agreed uh, with his perspective that he'd like to get a, a group of staff members together to work out the details on this because um, we, ha as opposed to the elementary, there's more complexity to the middle school schedule. Um, there will be staff members who have remote assignments. There's a team model, uh, which adds some complications to this as well. Uh, we would still be looking to return after the April break, so in the month of April. Uh, coinciding with what we, we anticipate being the intermediate elementary school grade levels. Uh, at the middle school level, again, this is all dependent on the number of students who choose to return. And so our thinking on the middle school is that Principal Sharon would like to convene a group of educators in his school to develop a model over the next couple of weeks. Uh, once the model is a little more clear, then surveying families about their interest in returning. Uh, can't really survey, we don't feel like it's fair to s survey families about their interest to return unless we can be really explicit about exactly what the model looks like. Um, he has a great group of secondary, of middle school teachers, and I'm sure there'll be volunteers who would be willing to work with him on this um, so that we want to make sure that they had an informed choice around this. But, you know, the likely model of, that we've seen for hybrid is sort of a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday model. We have some districts that around us have done week on, week off as well. Uh, but that's where I think engaging with the educators there, because we haven't been through this, you know, we never got to that phase um, in the fall makes sense for you know relatively quick turnaround to have the outlines of what the program will look like, survey families, get that feedback, um, and then implement at the end of April. The high school is gonna be a little trickier. You know, in my conversations with the public health department, there are real concerns and caution uh, about high school students return. As I mentioned earlier, there's, there's likely a reason why President Biden has talked about K to eight, uh, even, you know, in our state where there's a big push for return to in-person, it's been elementary and we'll see about middle school and maybe high school, right, is kind of the framing that I saw in that press conference. Um, and, you know, that creates some real challenges. The high school also has logistical challenges that there's so many singleton courses. So, for instance, if you happen to be taking a course and there's one teacher teaching one course and half the students are in and half the students are out, uh, we would sort of by the nature of it be eliminating that course option towards the end of the second semester from a significant portion of students. Um, you know, in the middle school, there's some of that, in elementary school, some of that, but at the high school, uh, by the time you're in the upper classes, you know, students are taking a wide variety of courses that, that really is unlike what we do at the scale at the elementary and middle school level. Um, so, you know, a lot of schools have done around us is a model that looks a little bit like an expanded, um, Opportunity, two things. One is making sure, you know, and thank you for your support of athletics. That's been hugely helpful for our students. I can't tell you how many students have mentioned that as being the highlight of their year because um, they are able to socialize in, in structured ways. But extending that to thinking about theater and other clubs and activities where students have access to um, not just athletics, because as much as I personally love sports, I know there's students who that is not what they would choose to do. And we want to broaden that approach. Um, and then really trying to have almost an expanded uh, model that, you know, doesn't have as much in-person teaching, but allows for students to be together. Uh, it allows for um, students to be accessing their classes, again, on screens. I want to be really transparent about this. Uh, but, you know, having lunch and having other opportunities to socialize during the school day. Uh, in our region, high school returns have been the least well attended uh, by students. You know, in general, the rule of thumb around here has been roughly two thirds of elementary, roughly half of middle school, and then less than half of high school students of your return. And you can find districts where that's different, uh, but in general, that's true. But for me, the most important variable is, is hearing from our local public health department, uh, understanding their concerns um, about having large groups of high school students back and in-person instruction, and still recognizing the very, very real toll that this year has taken uh, on our high school students and trying to balance those as best we can. Another one we really would need a, a group of educators to get together with. This is not something that 
we've uh, you know had mapped out in the MOA, much less so than the middle school, and certainly less than the elementary. Uh, but at this point, um, as much as I hate to say this, and this came up in my conversation with our high school students yesterday, although ostensibly it was about budget, it definitely uh, had a conversation about uh, this particular topic. Um, until I receive public health information locally that says it's a good idea to try to start bringing high school students back in more traditional formats, um, I don't feel great about doing that. Um, and and I, don't, I don't feel like it's the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's important to note none of this information pre-K to 12 should be seen as precluding the implementation of, of what was voted by these three committees a couple weeks ago. Uh, you may have seen that President Biden said today that he expects there to be vaccine supply uh, for every American by the end of May. Uh, some of our high school students will certainly be in that. You know, there is a vaccine that's already been approved for 16 plus. Uh, I think 12 to 18, you know, there's a decent chance, uh, or at least in the fall, that that will be accessible to all of our middle school and high school students. Um, and at that point, just if, if much of the country has been vaccinated, we also anticipate based on public health expertise uh, that our, our overall numbers will drop to the place where we're in a better place than we are now. So I know I'm coming with a, a wildly unsatisfying uh, response to particularly for high school students and families, uh, but I don't want to be misinterpreted that, you know, from our health department as well as the state EPH, uh, I don't want anyone to read too much into this, that this is a prelude to what fall will look like all indications from those folks is we'll be in a, a much more positive place when August, I say August because we're voting on the calendar a little bit, you're voting on the calendar a little bit, but um, that till that month, you know, till we return in fall. Uh, but at this point, we're thinking about high school students, particularly students who have less access to distance learning. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, we have some ELL students coming in in a couple weeks. Uh, we want to expand our offerings for other students who distance learning has been more of a challenge for to offer more in-person support for that. Uh, within our school building and see how far we can push it. Um, it's a hard model to staff because our staff is doing teaching. So, you know, how do you, we're working, you know, I'm working with Principal Sadiq on what this model might look like. It's another one like the middle school. We'd like to come back in a couple weeks and get a little more explicit uh, about the, what this would look like. Um, but, um, you know, and maybe public health information will change faster and vaccines will happen faster as, as I mentioned in superintendent update, but where things are right now, um, you know, what's been shared with me, it's not advisable to plan for much of a, a true in-person return at the high school level. Um, and I know that feels really conservative. Uh, we'll feel unfortunately conservative to some, but um, one thing I'm not, despite how much I read about it now, is a public health expert and I rely on the expertise we have locally. So that's what I was gonna share about secondary. All the same things with PPE and all that, that was all together between Pelham Amherst and the region. So I'm not gonna go over that again, um, but all those same protocols and all the same ventilation testing, all those same pieces uh, are, are in place at the secondary level as well. Okay, we'll, we'll um, start with questions, um, um, specifically to the secondary um, update before then we go into um, comments and perspectives. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Um, just a quick, quick question, if um, the update on the high school, if that applied equally to both Summit Academy and, and the in high school. Yeah, I neglected to say that. It was in my notes too. Um, so I think um, yes and uh, some of the students at Summit might be that some of the students who we would prioritize for having, you know, some limited in-person experiences. Um, you know, it, it's more the age than anything else and, you know, much like our intensive needs program has some in-person but it's not quite the same as traditional in-person. We, uh, we would view that the same. You know, it's been interesting. Summit is fascinating in that um, there are some students within Summit who this model is working incredibly well for, um, you know, distance learning and, and are not interested in returning. Uh, and then there's other students who are really struggling with it. And I think that it's mirrored in the rest of the district, but it's more acute. When you're talking about a, a smaller subset uh, and a small group of educators who know the students incredibly well because it is such a small community and tight knit community. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting case study for us, but we would want to much like the same as the high school, try to have, you know, some limits in person, a lot of mental health support, you know, like those types of things uh, as much as possible for in person. Um, but we still want to, you know, with the public health guidance we've received, be very cautious about bringing lots of students in. Ms. Seeger. I just want to understand more about the complications of bringing back high school students. Uh, realize there's a lot of one-off courses, so you have the complications of remote and in-person for that. But in general, is it that 
you don't have distinct cohorts the way you do at like the K through six level and even the teams in the middle school. Is it because they would tend to mix more? So contact tracing would be a lot more complicated and much larger number of students would be affected. Is that? So that's part of it. Yeah. So I think you described that well, that um, there's not a team model. There's not a fifth grade classroom that students spend their time in. Uh, the other piece is just some of the evidence of spread um, is higher at the, you know, the older students get. And some of that's based on, you know, or is believed to be higher, right? I'm not a scientist. I want to be careful with my comments. Some of that's based on just age and what we've seen, but some of that's based on socialization patterns out of school. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to be critical of high school students, but there's some reality if you look across the state of where there's been major issues um, based on socialization patterns has primarily been at the high school level out of school. And then when that comes in school, um, it's created some more problems, um, you know, and, and just, I don't know how to say this uh, politely, but there's more mixing of high school students and college students in our community than there is of elementary school students and college students writ large, right? Um, and, you know, that's what our students tell us. So I assume that's true. And I think I'll leave it there to not get myself in a little bit more trouble. But, um, you know, I think, you know, in terms of socialization, there's more opportunities that way uh, than perhaps there are with younger students. Other questions? Mr. Demling? Um, So uh, about when, I'm not tying you down to a specific date, but uh, what, what is the range of start dates that that you think is possible for this this phase one that you described at the high school of um, distance learning center and other socialization opportunities, maybe access to things like theater and whatnot? So in terms of the theater and other activities, we'd like to get that going certainly as soon as possible. You know, spring sports are coming soon. We actually have to vote on, I think I have to bring that to you because we'll still be in remote uh, at the time you have to vote. Um, and I think some of the other clubs, I think we can work on getting in sooner than the distance learning part. I mean, that may be more of a late April kind of timeline, but I would hope that we're able to get some of those other pieces, not just sports, in sooner. I know, for instance, there's conversations going on about outdoor theater um, performances or, or performance this spring, and that can't start in May, right? They'll just, they'll just run out of time. There's just way too much that goes into it. Um, so that's sort of the thinking. It may not be on the same timeline as, um, as each other, right? So the extracurricular activities is likely to happen sooner. Uh, having more students in and distance learning may be a little bit more phased and a little bit later. Mr. Demlin, is that a follow-up or a new question? It's a different question. Um, I'll, I'll let Ms. Kenny go first and then come back to you. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding about the high school correctly. So there's, We'll vote on sports. There's looking to expand like clubs and theater, things that can be done outside. And then more distance learning centers that will in be open to all students or more students. Yeah. I mean, the, the no high school, I'll, I guess I'll save my comments. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I think we're still working on how that's going to work. It is a really different model than what we've explored prior. And if staff members are teaching kids, then it's hard to them to be also managing a distance learning center uh, as well. So that's really where Talib and a team, sorry, Principal Sadiq uh, and a team, we talk so much that I call everyone by their first name and I shouldn't do that out loud um, here, but um, really need to work on a team of what that looks like and what our capacity is and also which students are interested. I mean, again, across our region, uh, and I don't want to say that this would be true at our high school, but high school students, given the options that even in districts that have done more than a distance learning center, some level of hybrid, it's been a much lower percentage of students who desire that. The interest in extracurriculars has been really high in many districts who have been open more than us. But in terms of the actual academic piece, um, it's been much more mixed. And so um, that's something that we have to work on how to staff that, um, where the space would go right now, our distance learning center for intensive needs students is located at the high school. And so we would need to also be aware of space because um, uh, that's taking over much of the first floor in terms of the ELL program that's starting in a couple of weeks and some of the special ed pieces. So um, that's something we'd love to come back to in a couple of weeks from now when the model's a little more solidified and the team's had a little more time to work on it. Ms. Seeger? You have two more questions. One is, 
in the in August or the early fall when we were talking about bringing back the elementary kids, I know some of them would have spanned into the middle school. Um, so is that part of the plan? Um, I think that might have been ruled out a while ago, but I can't remember. And the other question is for the, the kids that would be coming back for the middle school, are we talking um, full days? Or yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So on the first question, yeah, you were right. We were concerned about Crocker Farm. Literally, if every student at Crocker Farm wanted to come back, we would run out of space and not be able to do six feet. We have evidence now, just even from our little case study of one of the grade levels that is coming back and the volunteer return, that we are not going to be at 100% return. And that's what we're seeing at Wildwood as well when we survey families. Uh, so I think that is a rule out. You know, if lots of people have a change of heart in the next week, we could have a problem. And I'll bring that back to this group. We wouldn't, you know, to me, we wouldn't, we would try to problem solve it because I don't want to come off six feet. And I think no one in this committee at this point wants to come off six feet either. Um, the second question, we, we would be thinking of full days at the middle school. So that hybrid model uh, would involve full days of school, well, relatively full, what we worked on in the fall, which was starting a little bit late with the later start, but um, you know, uh, it wouldn't be like half days or anything like that. It'd be kind of going back to the original model that we talked about last summer uh, with the length of day. And again, we're trying to keep you know, as much as we can, keep to what we've already proposed, uh, because that's what we were planning to implement. And you know, we think we already got feedback from our community, uh, we had umpteen meetings, as you all remember too well, in the summer and, f and early fall, getting feedback and making adjustments, and that's what we'd like to stick to. And, and just going back to my pragmatist comments, we don't have time to upend the apple cart and create something new. I think there's a lot of places for good feedback on, you know, I know this group that's really interested in outdoor learning at the elementary level and want to hear their feedback and ideas. So I think on the instructional pedagogical side, and mental health, there's a group I know that really wants to work on it. That's where we can get some great feedback. On the logistical side, I think we are pretty much locked into uh, our programming. And um, I, I actually think having some non-variables <laughs> in this is actually a good thing. Because uh, because I think given our timeline, both with the state, but also just where we are in the year, we need to move forward. If we're going to move forward, we need to move forward with something that we've mapped out and planned. And uh, Mr. Demling, do you still have a question? Yeah, so I'll just as briefly as possible. So you mentioned about the concerns from the public health official, and I'm, I'm not commenting here, but I'm just I'm just trying to understand a little bit more, like specifically what the concerns are, and maybe you can't say further. But um, like I'm 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 honestly I, I'm confused by the large groups back with in-person instruction because like we committed to six feet, right? And um, and all the same ACH and airflow and windows uh, situation and uh, fewer days at the region. So like we, we knew those restrictions and we knew the schedule restrictions um, back when we planned this. And so I'm, 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 I'm a little, I, I don't know. I mean, are there other, is it other, is it other things other than high school kids tend to hang out with college kids that, that yeah. is driving? I mean, and I know, I don't, maybe it's not comfortable for you to speak on behalf oh. of Ms. Dragon, but um, I just, I feel like if I'm a region parent, I'm hearing this, um, I would want to know, you know, as detailed as possible. Yeah, so I think the two other pieces, one is that um, according to her and I think other people as well, there's evidence that um, spread of infection is greater uh, with, with students as they get older. Uh, and it's not just high school students hanging out with college students, it's also hang, high school students hanging out with high school students, right? It's, it's, it's you, know, um, you know, all you have to do is Google high school student uh, COVID outbreak in Massachusetts, you'll see a number of examples of that. And I'm not trying to say that all our high school students are irresponsible at all or any of our students, but the reality is when we've seen issues uh, in public schools, they've been more likely to be, you know, at that level. Um, and some of that's just the science behind infection and spread, and some of that's based on, you know, behaviors. They, they, they have, high school students have capacity to get together independent of adults really easily, and that's not true of seven-year-olds. Um, I'm gonna think seven-year-olds are super responsible. Um, some are, some aren't, but but the capacity is a little bit different as it relates to when, as students get older. So um, I think that's why both the president as well as our state seems to be pushing much harder on the elementary. I think the other reality, which we talked about in the summer, is that by and large, high school students have more access to both each other and to distance learning than elementary school students do. So if elementary school students don't go to school, their capacity to see the other elementary school students is pretty limited. There, are, you know, there's not like sports and other these activities that are set up. Um, and just from a learning perspective, many of our high school students have more capacity 
uh, and access to distance learning programs than you know students who can't read, students at the primary grade levels. That's not true for every elementary school student. Some are doing great. That's not true for every high school student. Uh, some are really struggling, but you know, as a generalization, I think there's some evidence of that. And I think, you know, I want to, you know, suggest that Ms. Dragon isn't alone in her kind of comfort level and interest in getting uh, younger students back more more acutely and quickly than secondary school students, particularly high school students. Um, you know, it's it's been interesting how silent both the state and the federal government have been on nine through 12 uh, in their public discussions of these matter. And I think that's for a reason. So I don't wanna just put it all on our local public health. That's, I don't have access to Fauci, um, you know, or, you know, other people, but I do have, you know, access to Emma, you know, more than she probably likes sometimes because we chat often, but she's very, very helpful and, and very informed. And, you know, I rely on her a lot and, and she hasn't sent me wrong. If there's no other questions or specific questions on secondary, um, then we will move on to comment um, or perspectives. So um, I will, um, and again, this is related to the, the proposed motion to move forward with this plan um, or the activities and work to implement this plan as um, outlined by Dr. Morris. Um, so I have, I'm going to call on people, if that's okay, Chair Hall, if I <laughs> um, call on folks. So um, actually, uh, why, don't, uh, why don't we start with you, Chair Hall? <laughs> oh, well, I didn't think it was gonna go that direction. Okay, um, <laughs> I mean, it, in some ways it's a lot to digest because it feels like a really long time since we've talked this way. Um, but at the same time, we really started having these meetings and these early conversations all the way back in June. We just did them more piecemeal. And tonight we're really drinking from the fire hose again. So none of it is really um, that new. And I guess in some ways feels kind of past due. Um, I feel really confident about the safety measures we have, the PPE that's on hand, the thought that has gone, gone into all of the layering of various precautions. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's time. I think there's a huge amount of work that's gone into this that has not started you know, in the past three weeks. This really, this has been many, many months of planning multiple documents and PowerPoint presentations and hours and hours of meetings um, to get to this point. So I do, I support this motion and this approach. And I guess just one specific comment, Dr. Morris, you were talking about the if classes are ready and using Pelham as an example, just to respond to that, I, I would agree with Mr. Demling. I think that whether or not it's Pelham, I mean, that aside, the, my district, you know, to the extent that we can, you know, equitable or not, it's not really the question because as, you know, Mr. Demling said, none of it is. Um, I just think to the extent that we can get children into classrooms and learning safely, we should do that as soon as we're able to and not wait. Um, I mean, I have so much more to say, but there's a lot of other people. So all in all, I just I support this motion and I really, really appreciate the enormous amount of work that the district has put in and really appreciate the enormous and kind of unending work that all of the teachers and staff have been putting in all this time to just keep the wheels on this bus all from March to now. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lord. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna just address real quickly some of, okay, the divisive nature that's still out there where pe teacher, some people are like, oh, teachers just don't wanna come back or they don't wanna work hard. No, our teachers have been charged with an impossible task this year, um, have done tremendous things to relearn everything, unlearn and relearn so much. So I just wanna say 
on both sides. No, it's not that parents just need a babysitter or it's not that the teachers don't want to come back to work. I, I hope that the people that are still feeling really hurt and angry or send us emails like, yeah, and if somebody dies, it's on you. If they could just take a deep breath and know that we're all doing the best we can. We're looking at science, we're listening to each other, and we're just doing a lot of work. And truthfully, it's devastating on both sides. I know both sides of the COVID side and the no school side. Just going to put that out there. So I spent the last few days rereading every single email um, from the parents. I don't want to be um, an elected official who's gone tone deaf. I needed to be back in every word and hear what your kids are going through or what you need. I made a spreadsheet of all the parents' names. Nobody's duplicated. And um, just to find out where we were at, and there were... 336 families that reached out to us. I, I um, contacted Dr. Morris earlier about how many families are in our school systems and 90 to 95% of this was elementary. So in our elementary school, we have approximately like 700 families. And if we're taking two thirds, because one third wanted remote, we're not gonna hear from the people that want remote say, don't bring my kid back because we said you can be remote all year. That's 462. So we've heard from like almost 69% of the families that want their kids back or didn't choose remote that there's crisis for some, it isn't working for some. I just, I really wanna hear every family and acknowledge that yes, it's could be time, <laughs> it is time. And this isn't including the surveys from the CPAC or CTEF, CTEF, SCTF doesn't work to say it. Um, so I just I, I just want to let everyone know out there, our teachers are amazing and parents, you're amazing too. I hear you, parents, caregivers, sorry about that. I hear you. I'm sorry if I've acted tone deaf. I'm not, we are doing the best we can and we're gonna do what we can to get you where you need to be. And then we're gonna address the next epidemic of mental health because that's something that's being created from all this isolation. I don't know. Did I address what I was supposed to address, Chair McDonald? I would say so. Okay. That's just my where I'm at right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ms. Seeger. So I, I um, had similar thoughts to Ms. Hall about this last week and hearing about Melrose and then hearing about um, commissioners, the commissioner's statement about what he wants to do um, from getting permission to have the say over what the educational hours, what, what counts as an educational hours, and then him maybe switching away from hybrid and remote counting as educational hours. Um, and like there's just a lot to digest and think about. Um, and the the commissioner, his statement coming out after the Melrose thing to me is is the thing I think we really, we, we see this coming. Um, and one of the things that I've learned, especially from our elementary schools, and I mean in Leverett, is the teachers are tired. They're really, really tired from working so hard and having to constantly shift gears. Um, our school has had some in-person for a little while, but then it was remote and then it's been back in in-person and we just phased in all the grades at a, at a hybrid model. Um, so I, I, I'm very much in support of looking at this now because we know it's coming from DESE, from the commissioner. So Melrose is important, but, but knowing about what the commissioner is planning to do I'd love to give the educators and the administrators in the school the most time that we can now to really plan this. Um, because it seems like this is going to happen. Um, and I think that like what Ms. Hall said, we have PPEs, we have, we or <laughs> the administration has put a lot of thought into this, um, has worked on the buildings, has supplies. Um, I was grateful to hear about the middle school um, including the staff in the planning. I think that's incredibly important right now. Um, and for the high schoolers, I'm glad to hear about 
more activities happening. I know it might be hard to bring the students in for classes. Um, I'd love to see them be able to come in for other reasons so that they can see each other and fill that need. So even though they might still be at home during the day, they have other social activities to look forward to um, that can happen. So I'd, I'd love to see a lot of that for them. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm in support of us supporting this now. Thank you. Ms. Kenny. Um, so first, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of the teachers and staff. I know not only from you know, seeing all the things that they're doing, but watching my own children, how much work and effort they are putting into there every day. Um, and it's not just the education part, it's trying to build community in their classrooms when it's really hard when everyone sits in front of a screen. Um, we have already done so much work to our buildings um, and I know that uh, remote is working really well for some families, and I think that is fantastic. I think we've developed a really great remote system, but I also know that that is not working for everyone. Um, and some of our most, you know, resilient students are now failing, not just academically, but socially and emotionally. And um, I, I am disappointed to hear about the high school students not being able to come back for classes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how to fix that problem, <laughs> um, but I, I do think, you know, having some other opportunities for them is fantastic. Um, I, I do worry about that that only working for students who have access to transportation. That's not a school bus. Um, where I know, like, you know, when I was in high school, if I didn't have the school bus, then there were no after school sports for me. So having that was important. So I, I'm, I'm concerned for those families. Um, I, um, let's see, let's see. Um, I, yeah, I fully support a return to in-person for as many students as quickly as possible. Um, I guess my only question would be is for the middle school and later elementary school students, if we're returning to pretty much what we had, what was designed and planned for, um, how come it's taking that much longer to implement? Um, but I, I fully support as many students back in classrooms as soon as quickly as possible. Dr. Morris. Yeah, it's okay to, I know this is comments, but that was a, a direct question. I think it's one that a lot of people have, so I wanna to try to address it clearly. Um, so uh, the, the three primary areas, one is um, to make completely new transportation lists and pick up and drop off. Uh, again, usually the fifth facilities department would start that project um, right after the school year lets out and summer school routes are done, and they finish it in mid-August. It's usually about a six-week process. Um, we're now talking about shrinking that to about three weeks uh, and having unusual runs, and then having to identify the number of students, you know, we can't go over our cap um, of students. So that's one of the barriers. The second barrier is that lots of kids, whether they choose in person or remote, will be changing classes and having different, you know, potentially different other adults working with them, what, depending on whether the adults are in person or remote. Uh, and there'll be some hiring that goes with that. So that's gonna take a significant amount of time to, to do. That's again where Pelham gets a little simpler because you're not reorganizing placement in the same way between multiple classes, but for the Amherst Elementary School and certainly for the middle school with the team structure, that will involve a lot of reorganization planning. And the third is we wanna make sure that we're training, offering training for our staff members, families, and students uh, sufficient so when they come back in, uh, they're ready to go, and uh, that also takes some time. So those are the three kind of major pieces. I will say that the staffing shifts uh, and the transportation shifts are more significant. The training, I think we're in pretty good shape uh, to be able to do more more quickly, but the other two will be significant barriers to how quickly we can return. 
and it's hard to explain that well, and I'll try to get better for Monday uh, for the elementary folks because, you know, if my principals were here and maybe that's what we'll do because they'll be in those meetings, they can describe all the uh, sort of uh, steps that need to be taken um, as the placement process plays out uh, and certainly the transportation. I think that one's a little more clean cut that people understand that it's different routes and you're, you're organizing that and, you know, we have a different cap of number of students who go out on a bus than we typically have. Um, but the other piece is, is really huge around student placement and teacher placement and making sure everyone uh, knows who's in their class, has time to acclimate, and if there's a change in teacher that we make sure there's time for the staff members to be able to communicate about the students before that transition takes place. Um, we don't want to plop kids in different classes without the adults having time to say, oh, you know, that one, you know, this is how this student learns best and all those pieces. You know, we want to do things well. We want to do it as expeditionally as possible as we can do it well. And, and that probably won't meet lots of folks' desires, mine included, um, but I'm going to err a little bit on the side of doing it well as opposed to doing it um, quickly. Okay, Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, so I just want to echo the appreciation for the teachers that I've been hearing from everyone. Um, we're all just going through a really um, extremely difficult time. I know when you mentioned kind of the students hitting the wall, I don't think the students are the only ones hitting pandemic walls right now. I think at least some of us on this committee are. I know I, I've been feeling that in my own life. Um, so I've also heard, you know, very strongly the urgency in parents' emails and messages, and I really want to appreciate um, the tallying that um, Ms. Lord did. I think that's really um, powerful. Um, and I know that we haven't been hearing as loudly from folks who are having a good experience in remote learning. It's just the, the nature of public comment. Um, so I do support a re return to in-person learning for the students and families who are eager to get back into the classroom. And um, I think it's just because we know so much more now than we did about how COVID is tra transmitted and how to mitigate transmission. Um, we also know more about the fact that um, you know, schools don't drive community transmission. Community transmission seems to drive this transmission in schools. If I'm, again, I'm not a public health expert, um, but I'm trying to, you know, summarize what I've what I've read elsewhere. What's been frustrating is is I've been concerned um, that the governor has so quickly followed his announcement of a need to return to full time in person schooling with a rollback of the mitigation measures related to activities like indoor dining, um, and I. I I just, I would like to say that I think it's really important that our community, and I believe Amherst does this, you know, really put schools first. Because I think I've been frustrated to see um, in the state, and I don't know if people have been paying attention to what happened in Texas today with a rollback of the state mask mandate. You know, we're not in Texas, but we're not done with COVID either. So I, I, I share the frustration that high schoolers won't necessarily be able to return to in-person learning, but I'd much, you know, I, I trust the public health guidance that you're receiving, Dr. Morris, and I think it's important that we listen to it and we move cautiously and in a way that is um, careful so that we don't face criticism for moving too quickly. I know we've been getting the exact opposite criticism. I think it's very unlikely we'll, we'll, we'll see that, but I do think it's important to listen to the public health experts. So, um, I guess finally, I just want to echo what I think I've been hearing. You know, people have reached out to me individually and um, who are concerned about the switch back to um, in person learning, kind of leaving students who choose remote for whatever reasons in their family's um, health status or, or things like that. And so I think it, it was really reassuring to hear um, the dedication to maintaining really strong remote learning options for those who need them. Because I think there are some many members in our community who still need those options and may be less likely to speak up. Um, so thank you uh, for all the careful planning that's gone into this and that I'm sure is going to continue to happen. Yeah, I just one thing that Ms. Spitzer's comment, it wasn't a question, but it made me think of was just one thing that that, that I hope will be helpful for some of our high school students uh, who don't come in in a distance learning center another way is I know that one of the challenges that we hear from high school students um, has been that they've been also taking care of younger siblings, particularly elementary siblings, while they're trying to do that. And and I guess a hope is for elementary fa for families who uh, do send their elementary child back 
who is, who, you know, the high school student who is performing childcare tutoring slash trying to be a high school student at the same time. Hopefully for some students that eases some of the burden. Not, not perfect, you know, and I want to sort of apologize publicly because I would love to get high school students in more often because uh, I know how beneficial it would be, you know, and, and, you know, that's the conundrum. But I do think there are certain students at the high school level who feel freed up to focus more on their studies uh, once siblings or other family members who they're assisting at the younger level are, are back in school. So, you know, uh, I'm not looking for a silver lining, but I think there is some reality that that, that is a barrier to some high school students focusing on their studies, even in a distance learning environment. Ms. Barlow. Thank you. Um, I want to start by, again, just um, sharing my utmost respect for our um, teachers, our paraprofessionals, our staff who have done an incredible job getting us through this pandemic. And I'm so appreciative for all of their energy and all of their efforts. Um, I also wanted to appreciate and, and share that, you know, it's so important that we have a community where people feel comfortable engaging in public comment. We've read lots of them, but it's really important and I feel really proud to live in a community which is passionate and engaged and all of those opinions really matter. And so I just wanted to thank all of the caregivers and families who took the time to, to send us voicemails and send us emails, or, you know, it really does matter. Um, I too sh shared some concern with the directive from the state level just to open schools. Uh, but I have to say today with Biden's initiative to really um, direct the states to prioritize teachers and the vaccination, that makes me feel a lot better about our ability to open the schools safely. And it's really important that teachers feel safe, students feel safe, that all families feel safe, but also feeling like we can continue to um, provide that high quality uh, virtual education for those families who need that. Um, so with that, I, I support this initiative and I think um, that I do feel that if schools are prepared to open up, then we should get students in classrooms um, for students who want to be there as soon as possible and not necessarily wait for everyone to get there at the same time. I just want to end by um, saying to thank you to Dr. Morris and your team for being so thoughtful and so careful and really working hard and tirelessly to try to, you know, think about this from every angle. This has been a ever-changing uh, problem and will continue to change, but I really appreciate all the time and energy you've put into to putting care towards our, our students and our community. Mr. Sullivan. Hi. Um, I guess first I'd like to say I'm sorry to our high school students who I who really do matter to us, but I feel like we failed you in some ways because it's going to be a year and a half before they get back into the school again. And so I, I, I feel terrible and I apologize to them, but it really is the situation. And, but you really do matter to us. And as far as the middle school, I started talking about that. I think it was our last meeting or two meetings ago where we really need to get the, they, the school, Current seventh graders have never been in that building. Maybe they got the field trip, but they've never seen the building. And then you've got your eighth graders who were only in the building for what, six, seven months. So we re there's really going to be two cohorts of new students. So we really do need to get them into the building because the role mo the whole role model thing is going to be lost. You're going to have really just new students and as far as the elementary school goes being a licensed educator birth through six between the EEC and DESE we got to get everybody into those schools as quickly as possible Thank you. Uh, Mr. Demers. so um, yeah so so two two kind of broad points one I want to address the question of process and our, our standing for making this decision now. So, you know, just a little, you know, reminder for the public, you know, we engaged for months last spring and summer and we voted this framework of planning, right? It seems like an age and a half ago in July. And that included all the, the broad um, decisions, the, the maximizing in-person learning, the six foot distancing, the masks, medical exemptions for staff, every student given the option to be remote that, that we should absolutely still support. Um, you know, that was an engagement process uh, over a long period of time. We then negotiated the impact of that decision 
through many hours of intensive input from and collaboration with the APEA, which resulted in the MOA for this school year that we have today with all of the staff protections and safety guidelines that as Chair McDonald noted, are still in place and are still honored. It's, it's just the metrics and the phasing section that has been invalidated. And then starting last October, our committee made three formal requests to talk about updating this metrics and phasing section. In light of the mounting research and data on COVID in schools, the record volume of public input we've received and continue to receive, including tonight, on the impact of remote learning and, and how we observed the automated metric and its usefulness. So to look at what we did last spring and summer and the MOA impact bargaining and our multiple formal requests over the last four months to talk about this auto closure mechanism, I, I feel I thought that all demonstrates that we did faithfully engage with and listen to both the public and teachers on the topic um, that we're talking about today and that we didn't rush to get here. So I feel comfortable with our committee making um, this kind of major decision. I think we should be confident in that. Um, you know, so we have four months left in the school year, a, enormous task for the district to execute on. Um, and we have this clear state ruling that the metrics and the phasing section isn't valid. Um, so I feel like it's the duty and responsibility of the school committee to decide the education model. And it's it, it's really only the school committee's decision. And, and I don't think that that's harsh or unilateral or top down to frame it like that. That's That's just how the legal management of a school district operates. So, you know, just like with our fall decision to provide full-time in-person learning for all students for the school year. That's, that's, that's those kinds of calls are, are what we're elected to do. And, you know, I certainly expect our district leaders to collaborate with our employees as needed as they implement the plan. And there'll be a lot of implementation details to, to work out and, you know, hire at the region level as described. And I have no doubt that they will. Um, but it's, I, I feel like we need to be really clear um, after all this public conflict that it's the duty of our elected office to reassess the conditions and make and make these calls. And and that's that's OK to say. And so this is, by the way, why the state's decision doesn't factor into my personal thinking at all, which, which is if we if we felt that it wasn't safe or appropriate or needed for our K to five to go back full time, then we should say that and we should and we should present the case. And then if the state disagrees, well, then we'll, we'll deal with that when they act. But, um, you know, we, we should assert the plan that we believe in. So, you know, so then, the, so that's the first part about process. So, okay, so what do we do? Um, you know, I go back to that planning framework where we, you know, repeated that we need to adjust our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. And that's really the, the key phrase for me. And I think about what has changed over the last, um, you know, six plus months. And, you know, first and foremost, other people have said is, is that the research and the evidence on COVID transmission in schools that we knew next to nothing about uh, last July and August. and uh, now we have a scientific consensus. This is, you know, we, there is no longer a false equivalency of, of, you know, depends on what you think or what you read. There is strong consensus scientific evidence from many well-conducted scientific studies that it is safe for schools to reopen when appropriate precautions are made. Um, you know, I won't, I won't quote all the different ways the, C, the CDC says this, the thankfully now non-politicized CDC, um, but when schools implement mitigation strategies with fidelity of the transmission can be limited. And Dr. Morris has gone over all those strategies, a, a number of which exceed CDC minimum recommenda recommendations, including the six foot minimum, not just one possible, the, the ACH, which, which is not a, a CDC requirement. You know, so that, that and, and we, when we then compare what our districts in our own county and across the state have been able to successfully do, um, it, it indicates that we can reasonably do it because we have those measures in place and we have we, we have the space for it. Um, you know, the other big thing obviously is the impact of the remote model on our students. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I won't, I won't itemize every single point that's been made to us over the last six months, but um, you know, in my view, we, we know that it does not work well for hundreds of our students. And many of them are in academic, social and emotional crisis. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. I feel confident saying that based on the volume of personal stories, the the heartbreaking messages we've received over and over and continue to hear. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to me whether that's 400 or 1600 or 200 kids. The fact that it's enough 
to manifest at this level should be enough for us to take action. Um, we, we understand the inequity. I won't go into all the evidence there, but that, that's another huge driver. Um, I think the inequitable impact of, of, of those who suffer from re um, in remote learning um, most, most intensely are our special needs students, our economically disadvantaged students and families. I think that point is, is not debatable. Um, you know, and, and this is, again, through no fault of our teachers who are doing the best they can under very trying circumstances, as other members have mentioned. You know, the fact is, is that students have experienced possibly irreparable damage um, to their lives and their education and many of our most vulnerable students. That's <laughs> as a result of their missing in-person education this year. And that's incredibly hard for me to name and acknowledge and own. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's our job on the school committee to, to set these things. And so we need to be realistic about what the state is if we're going to, you know, uh, most clearly define what, what happens uh, next. Um, you know, so in terms of how we manage the return to in-person, you know, I, I support the plan as outlined in terms of bringing back students as soon as safely possible. And I specifically support the part of the motion that does not mention metrics. And that says, well, how should this be managed? It should be managed by um, the superintendent making a decision in direct consultation with the local public health officials, continuous assessment of health conditions. That's, that's how it's, it, it, it should be. And, and in my view, what's become clear um, with, with, as we've watched how our, our metrics and metrics in other districts have worked this year is that there's still useful, useful reference points right, to prompt discussion and to see general trends and to inform decision making. But COVID risk assessment, I feel, is best done when it's informed directly by a qualitative assessment of health conditions and not an automatic set of metrics, um, e even though I come from a programmer background and maybe that suits my personality more. Um, and that's to that end, um, you know, for a very specific example of that, I'm really disappointed with what's being recommended for the region. And I'm really concerned about the mental and emotional health of these kids. Um, but this is exactly what we should be doing in terms of how we make the decision. A qualitative assessment informed by local public health officials that isn't biased in favor of one outcome or the other. Um, you know, it's not the school committee putting our finger on the scale that, you know, just get the kids in. It's not any other person or group putting their finger on the scale. It's the superintendent taking that into account and then, and then making that call. Um, so um, I, I really support that approach for the spring, um, you know, that, that will be consistent with what, what we do for that fall, for the fall. Um, um, and just before I end, like I said before, sorry, I inserted the opinion. I couldn't help myself about the, um, <laughs> the return. I think any class that's safe and staffed and ready to go should go in. Um, there, we have too many inequities across how we're implementing. And so that, that should be how you evaluate, you know, is it safe? Is it staffed? Are we ready? Um, and I really think that we need to push um, as much as possible to do what we can for, for our high school kids, especially their mental and emotional health and, and make it as, as high quality as possible. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Menino. Well, uh, everything has been said so far, I mostly agree with. Um, uh, I support the motion. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Morris for his thoughtful and uh, boundless patience in discussing these various issues. Uh, I trust his judgment. I trust your ability to do the right thing. Bring back the kids, bring back them as soon as possible. And I agree with most of the comments that have been said by the members before me. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so I, I think I've kind of, I guess, evolved a bit on this issue as, as we've progressed. And I, I, I probably, I, if I had a different day job, I'd probably feel a little bit different about this. But like, uh, I, I can definitely attest to the fact that, that we had workers that have, been, that have put in tons of work to make sure that we're safe. And, and when I say workers that, to, that are putting in all of this work, it's not just the, the folks working in the, in the buildings. You know, we have, it's the people feeding people. It's also our educators who are making a, a dollar out of 15 cents left and right, like, you know, making the best of a bad situation over and over and over. And, and so I'm definitely grateful to them. But like the, what I've had the, the most 
difficult time dealing with here is is the the uh, the blatant and obvious inequities that we have right now. And I mean, you know, like I, like I think about like Fort River, for instance. You know, not everybody there is catching the wave right now. You know, where you got people falling behind. You have a whole bunch of folks at Colonial Village that that aren't in schools yet throughout our, our town now. But so I, I think that we really just need to kind of get get out and get out ahead of the, the inevitable here, right? Like, like we're definitely, Desi is going to tell us that we have to send students back, right? I, I think we're at the best place that we could be to actually do that as a, as a district. But like, I would say the responsibility to do that kind of hit home at Crocker on Monday, right? When I, I had to run over there and find a Univent and, and, you know, I ran into all of these bright and shining faces, right? I see that almost every day in the, in the learn, distance learning centers, right? And, and, and I've seen those kids kind of evolve and, and brighten up day by day. But it was, that, the, the exclamation point for me was Monday that, I mean, it's, it's not just what we should do. It's what we have to do right now, right? And so I'm definitely in support of this, this motion. I also do think that we need to continue advocacy in terms of, of getting our staffs vaccinated, like that that's a, a key point here. And so I, I, I wanna keep hammering home on that. And, and also just working with our educators to make the best out of this year. It's This is this year wasn't great, right? We all know this year kind of sucked a little bit and I, I, I think we can kind of hit it home right here. That's, I think this is our opportunity to do that. Thank you. And um, answer. Well, going at the end, as, as everybody knows, is that there's not a lot to say that's original. Um, I definitely support this motion. I do think that it's really time to be doing everything we can to get the students back in the buildings. Um, I would like to echo all of your comments in appreciation in various ways for everyone in the system. Um, the teachers, the paraeducators, the nurses, the IS people, the food services people, um, and the administration. You know, without those people, many things would not have happened this year. The students wouldn't all have Chromebooks. They wouldn't have meals. You know, what we've done in terms of providing meals in the community for students, I think is is really great. Um, the facilities people, the bus, you know, the transportation people, there are just so many people out there that just aren't seen and are so important. Um, and I, I would like to say I appreciate the creativity and the teamwork that goes on at the administrative level, but that is also enabled as you move down through the different departments. Um, I think that's been crucial for the positive things that have happened this year and will continue to be. I was very pleased to hear about the middle school and the plan to have the staff work with the principal. Um, I think that's an indication of the kind of teamwork that is enabled in the system. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you, all of my colleagues on the committee, because I think we feel like we can say what we really think. And um, for those of us who have been in the community for a long time, uh, things don't always go as collegially as, as I think they have gone. So I just would like to thank all of you for being able to serve along with you. Um, and as a senior citizen on the committee, I guess I will say, you know, I would be happy to have the teachers and the educators and everybody involved who needs to be vaccinated before me. But I will tell you that I hope the state gets its act together because it is truly frustrating. Um, part of it is the lack of the vaccine in the state and particularly in this part of the state. But the I can't tell you what a frustrating process it is, and I still don't have an appointment. So um, I'm hoping that's going to get better. Um, 
So that's what I have to say. Thank you. And I um going last as 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 I did before and and as as many of you at the end of the line have also um stated it's it's nice because you don't have to say everything because a lot of it has been said and I do share um uh, bits uh, bits of everything that each one of you have said is um, uh, I, I would support and share um, that sense too. And I think one of the things that um, for me in acknowledging, uh, I also am, am grateful and thankful for all of the work that um, our, our teams in the schools, um, whether it's you know, facilities or food service or administration, um, paraeducators and teachers, everybody's been working for 10 months or more um, to, to get us to, to this place. And I also want to acknowledge that the parents and caregivers have been working their tails off. It's, it's everybody in our community has really gone, had to go above and beyond in every, every way. And I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are here to serve our students. And I know that we all agree. And just because we didn't all say that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't all share that. But I think it's important um, to say it out loud, at least at some point, that our, our, our families are struggling. And we heard that in some of the voice comments tonight, um, just beyond a breaking point. And that has as much of an impact on the, the emotional and, and academic um, health of our students, not just the ability to be in school or have um, appropriate supports in school or in distance learning. It's also the support and, and care of their parents and caregivers. And if they're breaking at this point, then, then we're really not serving our community. Um, and it's not to say, you know, by recognizing that, it's not to say that our teachers aren't at a breaking point either. And I think Ms. Spitzer, you commented that we're all sort of, you know, at pandemic fatigue. And I think I was even just even saying this to one of our colleagues um, last night that I, I feel that in myself as well. We've been meeting every single week. I, I haven't counted up, I, I should have counted up the meetings that we've had since, since March of last year. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I would also share, you know, the, the, appreciation for um, all of you um, for that. We've been meeting every single week and we've maintained sort of our sanity to a certain extent with each other throughout this. Um, and I'm going to just comment on my support of this, of this particular motion too. I, I said, our students are suffering, which we've heard academically, emotionally, their mental health, their families are struggling and they're desperate. Um, the other, these are sort of four or five points for of why I support it. Um, we are prepared. We have the PPE. We have the space. We have the ventilation that meets and in many cases exceeds the minimum acceptable. And we planned all of this um, last summer. We worked really hard. The, the um, administration, staff, facilities, nursing, everybody has worked really, really hard. This information has been shared. We've talked about it. It's available the, the, um, on, on our website. And what we know now from Melrose, the Melrose decision and from the legal opinion from our attorney is that we're not constrained. This decision rests with us. We have lots of opportunities as we, we just heard for further, um, for the district to be collaborating with, with the educators and the, and the union to sort of, to, to create the model and define it for, for the middle school and the high school. We're not, we're not, um, making a unilateral top-down decision. This is this is leadership and the community is begging for us to step in and take and and, and be those be that leader. Um, leadership isn't always easy and we're we're in, you know I, I hear Dr. Morris always say that you're doing well if, if there's at least an equal number of people angry as excited. I don't always like to hold up to that but um but I, I think you know leader making tough decisions is part of what it means to be to be a leader and it's not not at all easy so i'm not trying to suggest that it is um but the other the other i i, I sort of put as a last reason why is that the state may be may be making us do this because it as i think mr demling pointed out we don't we don't have to there's a waiver process we could 
But I think through all of the things that I just stated, we have the space, we have the PPE, we have, we're prepared. We, it, it's really difficult for us to say that we can't do this. And I think we have to do this. This is, this is our duty um, to really step in and, and, and be the leaders for our students, for our community and our, and our, our full school, uh, school community. Um, so we, I think we have all talked at this point. I don't know if there's any sort of lingering questions. We are coming back to this tomorrow evening um, for a vote. So we have the time to sit with the information that we got tonight. So the fire hose, as, as I think Ms. Hall talked to, described it, um, we can um, sit with that, think, think on that, and come back with any more questions that we might have on the, on the plan before we vote. I've also heard um, that the request to put the motion um, and post the motion so we can do that in, in the packet tomorrow so that um, community members can see what the draft motion is. Um, and with that, um, unless there's one, any more sort of final parting comments or thoughts from anybody, right, then um, we can move on to another um, small topic. Um, but I might suggest, um, are folks interested in a five minute break? Okay, so it's uh, 917, let's return back at 925. And I'd recommend just that everyone mute themselves and turn their camera off until people are ready, then the chairs will know when people are ready again. So. Um, which is uh, our start times, change in start times and possible vote for this evening. Um, and I know that, um, so for the if uh, for any members of the public that are um, watching us, uh, we this is the third time um, this year that we are talking about this uh, topic. We um, broached the topic at our January fifth meeting um, and agreed to um, to pursue or at least explore this option and, and invest um, an intensive uh, period of time to uh, to look at and consider this option. Um, after a series of uh, focus groups, information sessions, and a survey, um, the committee reviewed all of that information and feedback at our meeting on February 16th. Um, and the survey results um, from that are, I think, included in the February 16th packet. Yep. Um, so for folks that are watching at home, if you want to refresh your memory, you may look at that on our website. Um, so tonight is, I think, an update and um, a potential vote from the committee. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. I'm going to stay with my brief, uh, trying to stay, keep things brief. We've talked about this in depth at multiple meetings, and that's why I'm thinking you're going to be brief. So in your packet, you see a memo. It's, it's really a couple sentences long. Um, I'm not going to rehash the multiple PowerPoints and presentations that have been made, but uh, really just a summary is that we know that science would indicate um, very clearly the benefits of later start times for secondary students. Uh, we did survey, we got many, many responses, all the different stakeholder groups that we looked at by uh, student, family, staff, by different town, by elementary versus secondary. Um, there was um, support for making the flip. So have elementary schools start earlier than secondary schools among every single group. Uh, and I think mostly for the same reasons. We know there's gonna be logistical challenges that come with this. Uh, we know that you know, athletics will have to work through. It's possible that, you know, some sports, you know, I was talking to, you know, our athletic director, Ms. Stewart, about this the last couple of days. We talked about the lights helping. We may want to schedule more away games at the beginning of the year, which may be later, um, so that students might lose, you know, miss less school time, um, you know, and then home games, um, you know, later in the season when the sun goes down. So we have a lot of logistical challenges to overcome. And still, I think the benefits to students uh, over outweigh the logistical challenges that we'll face. And so you'll see the motion is written, you know, very intentionally, uh, the proposed motion to move the start, move to shift the start times to the next school year so that elementary schools start after 8 a.m. and secondary schools start no earlier than 8.45. Um, and I wanted to give our, particularly our transportation department, uh, a little bit of leeway here so that we weren't voting an exact start and end time and then it comes up that 10 minutes we need to shift things about 10 minutes 
And then we have to re-engage you in the summer because we found out that actually we need to start at, you know, uh, 8.55 instead of 9.05 or something along those dimensions. So, you know, I think there was a broad consensus that we didn't want to start elementary schools before eight o'clock. And we heard that in the feedback, both the live feedback in sessions, as well as the written feedback or typed feedback in the survey. Uh, we want to get as close to nine o'clock as possible uh, at the secondary level. So uh, the motion is a little vaguer than perhaps uh, you might have expected, but it's really just because I don't want to commit to things that we can't commit to. I know we can work out elementary starting after eight o'clock and secondary starting after 845. The exact times we're going to need to sort out. And, and again, with our Leverett and Shootsbury colleagues, and I know, you know, I've been in touch with Superintendent Colkeen. She knows this vote is taking place tonight. She's the superintendent, for those of you who don't know. And Leverett and Shootsbury and a close colleague of mine, uh, less so since we have had less snow days to talk about this year, but we still get, <laughs> keep in touch quite a bit. Um, so that's why there's a little bit of leeway in this vote um, that I'm asking uh, you all to consider tonight. But um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I think we've we've talked about this one in depth for many meetings. So there's no, no more slides for me tonight, really just a, a more simple motion and uh, trying to answer any questions that people might have. Ms. Seeger. One of the things I've been wondering about being from Leverett, um, if the region votes to change the times, then it probably follows that Amherst is on board with it. Um, I know you've talked to Leverett. I know you've gathered feedback. Um, it, it just what happens, like, if the region says yes, everybody else just follows suit. Has that been the general feeling that you've had? Um, it, I guess I'm just curious about that part in terms of your discussions with Shootsbury and Leverett. Sure. So, uh, and I'm not trying to be flipped about this. I think uh, I'm going to be really careful not to make statements that direct the Shever Shootsbury and Leverett school committees to do anything because I'm not an employee of the Shootsbury and Leverett elementary schools. I think we engage those communities because before these three districts that are here tonight were slated to vote on something we want to make sure there was broad support for the change including in districts that i don't work for um so the reason i've been communicating so much with miss uh miss colkeen excuse me is that we wanted to make sure that i was keeping her in the loop every step of the way and i think just because of the scope of these three districts i think she was very open to waiting to see if it passed here before bringing it for a vote of the leverett and shootsbury school committees um it felt a little funny to um, push the envelope in those communities when we weren't sure about the other districts' capacity to or interest in moving forward. Um, so uh, I don't think it was it wasn't designed as in oh uh, you know they have to, but I, but I do think logistically, frankly, there probably is some truth to that. I mean, our districts could would be okay with our bus contract as is if they didn't change, but Shootsbury and Leverett would have to they would have a hard time just because of the economy of scale, financially, it would be a real challenge to not have a joint bus system for them. For this particular district, you know, honestly, it'd be relatively low impact, um, but you know, we want to engage them because we know it would be a huge impact if they were off on their own looking for a bus contract independently. Um, so does that help answer it? I just, I want to be a little cautious in my language because I don't want to be, I'm very, I love the folks in the and Leverett and I also want to make sure I'm, I'm uh, not being too assertive in districts I don't work for. Yeah, no, I, I had just been wondering about the process because I've kept our committee up to date on what we've been talking about here and just sort of how does it play out and like what happens next. And I think you've answered that for me. So thank you. Mr. Demling. Um, are, are we doing questions, comments, or both? Both. Okay. Um, so my question is, is, is I'll, I'll do my question and you can think about that long comment. <clears throat> my, my question is about, um, because this changes the elementary, it's kind of related to what Ms. Seeger said, because this changes the elementary start time, is how, how parliamentary wise, are we sure that this is gonna work? Like, like wh which committees vote on this, right? Is, is does the region, it, it seems, because it seems a little weird that the region could vote to change the start time of the elementary. So does the Amherst School Committee need to make a motion that only changes the elementary start time and then the region make a motion that only changes the regional start time? That's my question. I'll let you think about that while I'm commenting, which is, this is such a happy vote. <laughs> I'm so happy that we have finally arrived here. Um, it's been a long haul. For some people in our community, it's been a really long haul uh, for people who have advocated for this in previous failed attempts. Um, and, and I do want to kind of acknowledge those efforts because I think sometimes 
for community support, particularly to reach a level which it has. I mean, 75 plus is almost unheard of in Amherst. <laughs> so, so if we have that level of support from parents, it's, you know, we, we that, that was more, you know, I mean, your engagement process was, was very good, Dr. Morris, but that didn't all come from your PowerPoint and from your um, charismatic speaking style. You know, that's, that came from, came from the community support of the idea and, and the value and understanding um, that we can implement it responsibility responsibly. And it's, there's so few times on school committee when we get to do something that is so clearly going to have um, a really well-established positive benefit for our students academically, mentally, and emotionally, and that is so well supported by both educational and medical research. I, I think a Comenantes program, the dual language immersion program at the Amherst level is the last vote I, I can, that feels like this one to me, right? That um, where we're, you know, and in that one, it was kind of similar is, is can we implement it in a responsible way? And is it feasible? And that's that's kind of been the focus here. And um, and you know, yes, there are some challenges, but I feel like with what you've described, we're going to be able to implement that, and particularly particularly with any concerns that we have um, with the change at the elementary level. So I'm I'm very happy to be able to support this. So and and I'm just really grateful that we're at this place. And and I want to thank you for your efforts, and as well as the efforts of our sister communities, because it was really the bus, the feasibility of the bus sharing that broke the dam on making this possible. So. Um, you know, kudos to our fellow communities as well. Thanks. Yeah, I can respond to the parliamentary question. Uh, it's my belief, I'm not a, a lawyer, but it's my belief that because it's a shared bus system, um, that it would be fair for all the committees to vote because every all three committees have a role in supporting the overall plan. In other words, we can't, I mean, I think logically, we know we can't run all the buses at the same time. Frankly, if we could, we could probably just have 845 start everywhere. And, that probably would work fine, but uh, that's not realistic or pragmatic. So um, I'm happy to be overruled by anyone in the committee. But you know, my sense is everybody. It, it could be a joint motion um, because everyone has a role in that, and I think it also makes clear for the elementary committees why they're agreeing to uh, have an earlier start time. Because you know, independent of the region, we you know, secondary schools, we probably wouldn't be changing the elementary start times. So I think parliamentary wise you know, the cab with the caveat or the explicit caveat that this is a shared transportation system, therefore um, one can't happen without the other. It feels okay to me. And thank you for your comments. And, and, and just to clarify, it's, it's a joint motion, but it's three separate votes. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Other comments or questions? Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to Pam and the Kosmeskis Bus Company because they served Shutesbury. My daughter was, she rode those buses for 12 years and they were running before she even started school. And they they were a nice little bus company that served Shutesbury and Leverett really well. And now that they have stepped aside, I can allow Mr. Demling to have have his dream of switching the start times around. But I am I'm I did I stepped aside, but I still feel I mean I'm I'm happy for my high school and middle school students who still have to get on the bus an hour before the Amherst kids do, but it'll be an hour later. Cause that's that is one long ride when you get from Wyola to the schools. But anyway, I just want to thank, you know, I'm throwing Shootsbury under the bus because we never really discussed this. I mean, I've, as Ms. Seeger said, I've kept my board up to date, but I'm, I'm taking this vote on my own because we've never talked about it thumbs up or thumbs down. But congratulations, Mr. Demling. Ms. Seeger. I feel like I'm in the same boat, Mr. Sullivan. Like we haven't had a thorough discussion about this, but I am so in support of it, especially watching my budding teenager sleep later and later and later. Um, I, and in terms of, okay, so if, if Amherst, if, if the committee's here tonight vote for this, then uh, Mr. Sullivan and I would like, well, the, the Leverett School Committee and the Shrewsbury School Committee also talk about it. If for whatever reason, one of those two committees says no, then our individual districts, 
for elementary have to go back and figure out a busing situation. Is that what I'm hearing? That's my understanding. And, and I did have that conversation uh, with Superintendent uh, Coquine as well as um, the principals uh, of both schools were on that call. So, you know, we did have this conversation on the staff end. Yeah. It's, you know, and that's one of the reasons we went to the flip. I mean, I think you heard me say, I think there's lots of reasons to go to the flip, but uh, the original idea that I thought was simpler of just pushing everyone back half an hour just wasn't doable in Chutes Bear and Leverett for, for a whole host of really good reasons that I wouldn't know because I don't work there. Um, so this was sort of the, you know, what felt supported by the leadership in those districts. And I think you're right, it will have to go to the school committee, but I do think, you know, um, trains out of the station a little bit um, at this point. And some of that's just logistically, you know, it, it's it's early March and um, people need to know what the schedules are going to be. And our, our, our transportation department, in addition to all the things they're doing in the next month for this year, they're going to have to get to hard work for next year about mapping all this out. So. Go ahead. I just want to add on, um, say, just to say thank you for for being in touch with our districts as much as you have. I, I know that you've been, you did a presentation to the staff at our school um, and talked to them. So thank you for all the hard work you did on this. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I was just thinking. So. You know how with our electric bus and they were calling Amherst a rural district, now we could really give that electric bus a run for its money and send it up to Wyola one day and see how it really performs. That, that a winter, Steve. I think that's the perfect time for it, right? Icy roads and a slush of spring. Yeah, just like on Saturday when my truck slid off the road into the mud. Yes, that's from ice to mud on the same road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I um I haven't been around from for, through through all variations of this conversation on the school committee. I know that um I think it was happening um when my kids were still in preschool so I was paying less attention to it at that time or maybe not preschool but sort of so far away that I was not paying attention. Um but I I um also will say um I'm uh, one grateful for all of the work that um, that you, Dr. Morris, and, and team have been have done in such a short period of time. It's not like you don't have anything else on your plate right now. Um, and so I think having the work that you've done and um, in, in especially getting the feedback and input from the community is tremendous. And um, I also share like wow, three quarters percent, three quarters of surveyed families. Um, and individuals um, are in agreement on this. It's 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 a rare opportunity. So I, um, um, it's a rare si situation. And I think you know, in terms of um, taking a really really strong step in support um, a, in, in an initiative to have positive impact on um, our student wellness um, and and academic performance, and particularly at coming out of the year. Um, year plus of, of this pandemic that has been so challenging for our students. And the one bright spot for our secondary students has been the later start. Um, and so to be able to um, continue that into, into the new school year, I think is, is tremendous um, and a tremendous, um, will be a tremendous support in sort of building back. Um, any other um, thoughts or questions before we voice the motion. Uh, okay, seeing none, um, I will actually make the motion for the regional school committee. Um, I uh, move to shift the start times for the 2021-2022 school year so that elementary schools start bef after 8 a.m. and secondary schools start no earlier than 8.45 a.m. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved by McDonald and second by Demling. Um, and we will take a roll call vote of the region. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? 
Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Answer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes the region nine to zero, unanimous. Um, I'll turn it over to Chair Hall. All right, uh, I will make the motion for Pelham School Committee. I move to shift the start times for the 2021-2022 school year so that elementary schools start after 8 o'clock a.m. and se secondary schools start no earlier than 8.45 a.m. Is there a second? Second. I heard I heard Ms. Stancer. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Stancer. Um, we will do roll call vote. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Passes five to zero. Thank you. And I'll now make a motion for the Amherst School Committee. I move to shift the start times for the 2021-2022 school year so that elementary schools start after 8 a.m. and secondary schools start no earlier than 8.45 a.m. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. And I will call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously, five to zero. Thank you, everyone. Um, and as Dr. Morris um, indicated in our previous conversation, we're going to shift the next topic on pooled testing to next week so that we have um, more information and also it's, so it's not almost 10 o'clock. Um, so now we are uh, moving on to future agenda planning. I mentioned, um, it was, I don't think it was in the packet, um, but I mentioned that uh, the region is meeting next week. Um, I'm trying to find the document, sorry. The region is meeting next week. Well, we are all meeting back here again tomorrow, obviously, um, to continue um, uh, our discussion and possibly vote on the return to in-person in spring 2021. Um, and then the region is meeting next Tuesday. Um, it is our um, uh, second budget hearing. And um, we'll also be uh, looking to vote on a school choice um, and looking at and discussing the high school block schedule. Um, looks like the Pelham School Committee is also meeting next week on Thursday. Um, Amherst School Committee then meets on the 16th for its budget hearing on um, uh, fiscal 22 budget. Um, at, and actually hear about um, ads and cuts and the details um, of the Amherst school, school budget. We'll also be voting on the school choice, um, discussing capital, and then making our decision on the coming on to sibling enrollment policy. So that's all coming up in March. We did move out. Um, we had had the middle school grade span report and next steps on the agenda penciled in for next week. We are shifting that out um, to the first uh, regional school committee meeting in April. Any questions? As always, please email me um, at, at for Amherst School Committee or Regional School Committee agenda um, questions for ads and chair hall for Pell. Okay, um, we do have one gift uh, this evening for the region. Um, it is in our packet on the last page. And just to keep going, um, I will move that we accept the following donations. Um, from Jones, the, the region, sorry, accept the following donations from Jones Group Realty, Realty number 73631 to support FY21 high school scholarship in the amount of $500. From ARPS Friends of Performing Arts number 315 
to support student activities theater account in the amount of $5,707.71. From Florence Bank, number 219379 to support FY21 high school scholarship in the amount of $500. From Dean's Beans, number 14064 to support Kids Stimulus Program for Child Hunger in the amount of $2,000 for total amount of gift, uh, sorry, total amount of cash gifts in the of $8,707.71, plus um, a grant um, uh, from Project Bread, um, the amount of number 100563 to support community meal support grant in the amount of $2,000. There's a lot. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Morris. I just want to particularly call out, I think I might have done this in a previous meeting, but the Dean's Beans piece um, was not a grant. It wasn't something we requested. It was an acknowledgement of food scarcity in many communities in Western Massachusetts and an acknowledgement of many districts. We're not the only one to receive it, but that are going um, above and beyond to support families during this challenging time around food scarcity. So I want to just point it out because a lot of other grants, they're all wonderful in the donations. I don't want to make it one's better than the other, but I think it is notable that we had uh, a business that um, saw what districts like ours are doing and wanted to contribute to it to make sure that we're able to continue to work on the food scarcity issues that are, are so prevalent. So just wanted to call that out and thank that organization because oftentimes there's competitive grants and we apply for them. You've seen this year, we've done very well with competitive grants, but this was not a grant. This was uh, really an acknowledgement of the need and acknowledgement that schools uh, across Western Mass uh, have become staples of supporting families in terms of food this year. So thank you all to everyone, but I wanted to just uh, particularly thank Dean's Beans for their generous donation. Thank you. Is there any more discussion on the gifts? Seeing none, um, of, uh, roll call vote of the region. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. And Ms. Donald, I. The motion passes unanimously. Um, and I'm uh, Ms. Sharkas. I'm not sure if it was clear that was the motion was made by um, me, McDonald, and seconded by Spitzer. Uh, now we have uh, warrants. I don't know if. Uh, Mr. Hall or Ms. Spitzer, if you have warrants for your. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Hall. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I went out for a second. Okay. Um, I authorized by my signature to payroll in the amount of $57,513.55. Um, that was dated February 24th, 2021, and I signed that on February 22nd. And um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of, oh, it's not added up, sorry. Um, can you, can I do the math really quick? Can you come back to me for this one? It's not, the total isn't on here. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry. Ms. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm ready to go, okay. Um, so I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $309,983.95 for the warrant dated February 17th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $289,578.18, revolving fund expenses of $10,652.81, grant fund expenses of $9,000. $593.91 and other funds in the amount of $159.05 for gifts and capital. This was signed by me on February 18th, 2021. Um, I also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $222,481.37 for the warrant dated February 2nd, sorry, February 22nd. 2021. This included general fund expenses of $183,463.94 and grant fund expenses of $39,017.43. And I signed this on February 22nd, 2021. Finally, I authorized to buy my signature to payables in the amount of $637,074.60 
sorry, yeah, 60 cents for the warrant dated February 26, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $607,544.60, revolving fund expenses of $29,530, um, and this was signed on February 26, 2021. And um, I have one. Um, I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $173,519.36 for a warrant dated February 26, 2021. That included general fund expenses of $149,237.05, grant fund expenses of $13,381.78, school reopening fund of $9,230, miscellaneous in the amount of $1,000, a gift to the schools of $670.53. And I signed that on March 1st. And I believe that is all the committees that have warrants to report. <laughs> I just see my one <laughs> total, sorry, go back. Okay. I'm going to try this one more time. I'm sorry, everyone. Okay. I authorize by my signature to payables in the amount of $33,777.93 for the warrant dated uh, February 24th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $27,977.93, other funded expenses of $5,800 for FY21 articles, and I signed that on February 26th, 2021. Awesome. Thank you. So um, I believe we're now at the end of the line for the Amherst and Pelham School Committee. Um, is there anybody from Amherst who would, would like to make a motion? I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Lord second. Um, moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. There is no discussion. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, I. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Chair Hall? I move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Hall, seconded by Barlow. Uh, no discussion, so roll call vote, uh, Ms. Barlow. Barlow, I. Ms. Dancer? Dancer, I. Mr. Menino? Menino, I. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, I. And Hall, I. Pelham is adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Bye. Okay, so we have, um, for the region, we have two more topics to get through. Um, uh, the first is our, um, is the vote on the 2021-22 school year calendar. And that um, we've seen this calendar, I think, um, in our, in a pre prior meeting, this was one of two alternates. Um, and my understanding is that this one is the one that is voted or approved by the APEA. Yep. So they surveyed their members. Seventy-five percent supported uh, this survey. They offered some some very helpful uh, minor, you know, feedback about just wording and and uh, a couple minor errors. You know, we moved the, uh, for instance, the draft that you saw had the winter, um, the January uh, teacher workday where a lot of teachers work on report cards too early, so we pushed that back, and that was really helpful feedback. So it was like a lot of things like that, but the core model of the calendar is is what you're seeing and and the APA opinion and thanks for their collaboration on this was really helpful both the feedback but also their outreach during a very busy time was really helpful and I completely agree with both their feedback and the option that they favored and that's the only re the reason there's one calendar in the packet tonight is that I think we have consensus between the APA as well as the administrative team on the best calendar for next year uh, the short story is it starts slightly earlier than we have the last couple of years, and that takes into account uh, Juneteenth and Three Kings Day being off. So, um, you know, and doesn't make us end on June 30th or something like that. Um, it also uh, avoids um, the first day of kindergarten uh, being on Yom, uh, Rosh Hashanah, excuse me, uh, for next year, which was brought up at this meeting, um, at, at a meeting of this body. So, um, you know, I feel good about it. I feel like it's a schedule that recognizes some holidays that we should be celebrating and then takes account by starting the school year a little bit earlier. So we end in a pretty similar place that we usually end uh, and avoid some of the other religious holidays that we want to avoid for the first day of school. So um, that's where we are. I'm happy to take any questions before a vote. Ms. Dancer. Um, one thing, this doesn't say what the actual last day of school is. 
Sure. So um, it's at the very bottom uh, in red. It says uh, June 23rd would be the last day if there are five snow days. And no, don't say that. Um, I'm looking in the packet on page three. It said the last thing I see is June twentieth, not June. T oh, maybe it's the way it printed out in my printer. Oh, well, I'm sorry. It must have gotten cut off on the bottom. Uh, but on the, I mean, I'll just read it to you so you don't have it. In, it's because you don't have it in front of you. Sorry about that missed answer. Okay. So the bottom line says June twenty third, last day with five snow days, and then parentheses says June fifteenth, earliest possible last day. Last three days or half days at middle school, high school due to high school exams. Last day is half day at all schools. So I apologize that it, it maybe just the formatting made it print funny. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Seeing none, I will move that we approve the school year calendar for 2021-2022 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. I will take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Answer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Did I say Mr. Harrington? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, and McDonald, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And now we move to our last item, um, transportation reimbursement MOU vote. And I will turn it over to you, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter. Sure, so uh, so we hit the 10 o'clock mark, so I'm gonna encourage Dr. Slaughter. He, spent, uh, he sent a, a very large amount of background material for I think what should be a, a relatively simple Vote. So I'm going to try to do a time limit for Dr. Slaughter, three minutes or less to describe this and then see if there's questions. And then, you know, perhaps there's another motion that could be made after after this vote. You know, the agenda gave me 20. <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in spending that kind of time. So the long story short is this. We're compelled to transport these children, foster kids that are in foster care. Uh, we track those costs uh, and report them on our interview report to DESE. Uh, and so the reporting requirements to get this access to this additional funding through the through the state uh, is no real additional work. I think uh, when I was compiling the data for this, it took maybe 10 minutes uh, based on what I had already done for the state interview report. So it's a it's an opportunity to get uh, part of an unfunded mandate supported, and uh, the state's going to do most of the legwork. We just have to to uh, get this MOU on file and then uh, submit our report each year in order to get our funding. Uh, Get us get ourselves in a queue for some funding that would reimburse us a small part of, of what we've expended for this kind of transportation. Um, the amount that we spend on this type of transportation year to year varies considerably. There's some years we have very little, some years we have considerably more, but I think this last year was kind of typical. Uh, and so what 20% of that that cost would be is about three thousand dollars to the district as far as additional revenue that helps us offset our costs. I think I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions. I think you came in under three minutes even, so well done. <laughs> Do my best. <laughs> Any questions? And well, and so well presented that nobody has questions either. Um, so this is a vote um, to, uh, I'm not sure the, the the, the wording of the of the potential motion vote to approve the MOU. Actually, at the bottom of the at, at the bottom of the memo on page thirteen of your packet, I propose the motion language for you. I'm happy to make the motion as I'm looking at it right now. So um, I propose I I move to authorize the Amherst Pelham Regional School District to enter into the attached memorandum of understanding for the purposes of Title Four E reimbursement. Second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Stancer. Is there any more discussion? 
Seeing none. Oh, Miss Seeger. Sorry, I realized I have one question. Um, why, why is it that the region has to enter into an MOU for something that it, it just feels like this should be something that you wouldn't have to jump through additional hoops to get reimbursement for? So, and, and maybe that's not an easy question to answer. It just seems to me, I, I just wonder why we have to enter an MOU to do this type of thing. I think this is a bit of a caution on the part of the state um, because there's multiple agencies involved and they're creating a partnership with us individually to do this. Uh, and they want our uh, agreement that we're going to hold up our end of the bargain, which is to, to do the documentation and preserve the paperwork. And they want a guarantee of that because they're ta they're filing with the feds uh, and they want to make sure that we're committing to what we need to do so that if ever they get audited at a fine level of detail, we can produce what's necessary. So I think that's the reason for the formality of this. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll uh, move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously, 9 0. And I believe we only have one more motion to make. Move to adjourn the Regional School Committee. Second. Move by, uh, moved by Spitzer, second by Demling. There's no discussion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye, and congratulations once again, Mr. Demling, on your late start. It was a, a long slog, seven years. I kept saying no, and now I said yes. <laughs> your chair is very patient with your open meeting law violation, sir. McDonald, <laughs> I. <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs> Night.